Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Damon Wilson, president and CEO of the National Endowment for Democracy. And it is really my pleasure to welcome you both in person, those that we have here socially distanced, and to those who are joining us online to the Endowment's 2021 Democracy Award. I want to offer a special word of thanks to our friends at the Hereford Foundation who have generously contributed to support this event and for their longtime support for the endowment and its mission of supporting freedom around the world. For those that are on social media, you can follow along on Facebook and Twitter, and we encourage you to join the conversation throughout the evening using the hashtag Dim Award and hashtag Ned Democracy, any democracy. Democracy and freedom are under pressure around the world. News headlines are filled every day with tragic stories and setbacks from Afghanistan to Burma to Nicaragua. But here at the endowment, we have the privilege of working with those who have the courage, the determination, and the capability to change things. Grassroots civil society activists who will not be deterred. It is their stories which gives us optimism. It is their resilience which helps us see a pathway to democratic renewal. And it is their sacrifice which inspires us each and every day. And that's why we are gathered here today. This year's Democracy Award honors the work of four courageous civil society groups who are working to confront the crisis of democracy in a region so close to our own Central America, as we heard at the White House today, a region that is our home. These four outstanding organizations are representative of a larger effort at the grassroots in Nicaragua and Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala to address critical issues of governance, accountability, and human rights that are so fundamental to the struggle for democracy, justice, and human dignity in the region. Across Central America, democracy and its institutions are under duress as authoritarians and autocrats consolidate power <coughs> and further destabilize and impoverish citizens of the region. From co-opting of the judiciaries to full-fledged attacks on the political opposition and civic actors alike, proponents of democracy are increasingly worried about what the future holds for Central American democracy. In Nicaragua, seven presidential candidates and two dozen civil society leaders are behind bars or under house arrest as sham elections approach. In Honduras, multi-party elections are approaching, but they leave citizens with few honest uh, opinions and options at the polls. In Guatemala and El Salvador, civil society is loudly decrying closing civic space, threats to freedom of expression, and growing human rights violations along with entrenched impunity for past abuses. Throughout the region, rule of law seems more the exception than the norm and the political leader less tolerant of dissident voices. So governance and development opportunities for citizens continue to be stymied as crises strain the system. And any voice contesting the narrative of a ruling party or regime are often very unwelcome. And so it's in that context, that tough context, that the bravery, the commitment, the talent of the endowments partners who are with us today is truly to be celebrated. Often at great cost and personal risk, our partners in civil society and the independent media sector are working ceaselessly, ceaselessly to find and preserve opportunities for progress, to expose anti-democratic actions for their governments and chart new paths and ideas for a more just future. Ultimately, the pathway to peace, security, prosperity, individual dignity is rooted in a strong civil society capable of exposing injustices and the nexus between corruption and organized crime and holding governments and institutions accountable. And that's the story we're going to hear tonight. So to set, set the scene for our award presentations, which are gonna take place this evening at six o'clock, we're privileged to be hearing from a range of experts and officials who are deeply knowledgeable about the conditions, the challenges, and the opportunities facing the region and our honorees. The endowment, after all, is a leading center of democratic action and thought. And so we're, we're tapping into both of those traditions today with extraordinary activists, but also practitioners, academics, and strategists. We'll have two discussions, the first examining democracy and governance in Central America, defending civic space and independent media for democratic accountability. And a second discussion featuring our honorees to hear more from them 
about their work and what's at stake and the struggle for democracy in Central America. But before we get in our discussions, we are delighted to be joined to have with us the United States Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs and the Special Envoy for the Northern Triangle, Ricardo Zuniga. Mr. Zuniga was Special Assistant to the President and Senior Director for Western Hemisphere Affairs at the National Security Council from 2012 to 2015. He has worked overseas in Mexico, Portugal, Cuba, Spain. He served in the State Department's Office of Cuban Affairs and in the U.S. Mission to the Organization for American Mistakes. And apropos for this evening, he was born in Tegucigalpa, Honduras. So thank you, Special Envoy Zuniga, for being with us. Let me invite you to the podium. Thank you very much, Damon. I'm just far enough to need my glasses, so I'll take care of that. First of all, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction and for the invitation to be here today. Uh, I, I was mentioning to Damon when I arrived uh, that we often cite the work of the NED as an example of what the United States can do, what we really can do to help people who are really working to preserve and advance democracy and, and institutionalism in their countries. Uh, we're very proud of uh, the National Endowment for Democracy. That's something where there's strong bipartisan support and that we need more than ever, because as you said, democracy is in a period of strain, not just around the world, but right here near our home. And I think it's important to cite that as well. We are, uh, we're working together in Central America. Let me get that, okay. Usually I'm too loud, so I'm very glad to be. Uh, so we're, we're really honored to be here uh, with, the, with the NED to cite the tremendous work of the four organizations that I had an opportunity and the privilege to be meeting with now and uh, some of whom are old friends from other work in Central America. As you said, these are examples of resilience and work, positive work on behalf of their countries under very difficult circumstances. The United States has never been more closely linked to Central America than we are today. We have strong cultural ties, vibrant trading relationships, uh, and strong family connections between every country in Central America and the United States today. The people of Central America have enriched American life with energy and determination and contributed to our success as a country. At the same time, societies in Central America are struggling to overcome generations of inherited structural problems such as pervasive inequality uh, and impunity for past abuses. Lack of judicial independence, something we had just had an opportunity to discuss uh, with our visitors, enables corruption, undermines the rule of law, and discourages economic investment. As we recognize the essential work done by today's award winners, I think it's appropriate to reflect on why their work is so important, why we need to look no further uh, than uh, the situation in Nicaragua to understand that the suppression of democracy leads to social and economic disaster. Authoritarian governments cannot deliver stability and prosperity. That's a fantasy uh, that continues to be told and sold by populist and hybrid governments around the world. And unfortunately, this is something that we are seeing very much in Central America. If Nicaragua is the destination, unfortunately, there are elements of movement in that direction and other parts of Central America as well, particularly as it relates to the relationship between governments, civil society, governments, and the free press. The fact that today at the OAS, 26 countries in the Americas voted in favor of a resolution condemning the direction of events in Nicaragua ahead of elections that are lack any credibility uh, as representing the will of the people should inform us that there is at least an understanding of the dangers for the rest of the region if they follow that model. Unfortunately, the Ortega Murillo regime in Nicaragua is not alone in perpetuating the belief that authoritarianism presents a viable option for the people of the Americas. The work done by the Colectivo de Derechos Humanos Nicaragua Nunca Más to preserve 
historical memory and seek justice for victims of the state-led violence unleashed by Ortega and Murillo in 2018 is just and necessary. The dedication of Gonzalo and Wendy and the rest of the organization has been critical to promoting and protecting the rights of human rights abuse victims. Unfortunately, as I said, as we look around the region, we see too many examples of government officials seeking to place their own interests above those of their citizens. Threats to judicial independence in El Salvador and Guatemala demonstrate the attempts of some individuals to shield themselves and their associates from accountability. Thanks to the work of transparency organizations and independent investigative media, these leaders and other individuals cannot hide in the shadows. In just five years, Tracoda has established a firm reputation in El Salvador for their advocacy for increased transparency and access to public information. Carlos and Diego have ensured that Tracoda creates pipelines for future leaders to continue pushing for oversight of government actions and promoting citizen advocacy that's at the core of democracy everywhere. Likewise, in Honduras, Contra Corriente has exemplified the tenacity and endurance needed to shine a light on corruption and hold officials to account. Jennifer and Catherine have increased attention to gender-based violence, the dynamics of migration, and LGBTQI issues in Honduras, and in so doing, have strengthened protections for vulnerable, vulnerable groups. In Guatemala, Helen and Lisette and their colleagues in the Myrna Mac Foundation have advocated for transparency and accountability and fought to ensure the voices of all citizens are heard. The Biden-Harris administration has prioritized strengthen, strengthening of democratic institutions and good governance across Central America. As part of our comprehensive strategy to address the root causes of migration, the United States is working with civil society, the private sector, governments, and other partners across the region to address the serious governance concerns that continue to limit Central Americans from fully exercising their rights as citizens. Too often, corruption, weak governance, disinformation, and impunity undercut human and civil rights and fuel the potential of authoritarianism to spread to other parts of the region. And that threat is very real. Your four organizations are a bright light exposing injustice, inequality, corruption, and impunity. As Justice Brandeis wrote in 1913, if the broad light of day could be let in upon men's actions, it would purify them as the sun disinfects. And your organizations showcase just some of the great work being done in Central America and the commitment of Central Americans to build a brighter future for themselves and their children. That is true resilience. I'll finish by sharing what Vice President Harris said just a few months ago. Our administration firmly believes in the potential of the region and the power of the region. Latin Americans are shaping their own future and writing their own story. You hold the pen. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Special Envoy Zuniga Ricardo. Thank you very much for those words. I want to invite the panel uh, that's going to be to come on up and to take the four center feet seats uh, while they're gathering. I'm just going to take a moment to, I'll let uh, Moses Naim introduce our, our guest, but it's my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Dr. Moses Naim, who is no stranger to the endowment. Um, he served on the endowment's board of directors for, for nine years, including stints as a regional expert for both Asia and Latin America, distinguished fellow at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace, uh, internationally syndicated columnist, um, the host of his own show, uh, the former editor-in-chief of foreign policy, author of 10 books, and a former Venezuelan government official. It is fantastic to have you back at NED. I'll let you introduce our guests, including our colleague who's joining us online. Thank you so much for the kind introduction. Delighted to be here again. This uh, used to be my home for a long time uh, also, so very happy to see progress. Let me bre uh, introduce the, the, the wonderful panelists uh, that will guard a, a conversation. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Inter-American Commissioner for Human Rights, Antonia Urrejola Noguera, who is with us uh, via Zoom. Welcome, Commissioner. Um, she is uh, from Chile. She's an expert in human rights and transitional justice. Uh, Commissioner Urejola has spent much of her career building the legal and institutional infrastructure of human rights in Chile and advancing and defending the rights of indigenous people. Welcome. Uh, Luis Botello, to my right and your left, uh, uh, is the deputy vice president of the new initiatives and impact of the International Center uh, for journalists, uh, where he also ran the Latin American program for a decade. 
Luis keenly understands and has experience and has lived it directly, uh, the impact, the importance of defending every day the space for independent media in the region, the indispensable fight, daily fight for freedom of expression and freedom of the, of me, of the media. And defending the space, especially of independent uh, uh, entities, independent media companies, media organizations, NGO. And based a lot of that base was based in the, is based in his own experience in his native uh, Panama, where he worked as a journalist uh, and, uh, and suffered the consequences of being uh, uh, an independent uh, prof uh, professional. Um, last but not least, uh, Santiago Canton. Uh, who joins us from the Inter-American Dialogue, where he directs the Peter D. Bell Rule of Law Program. He has spent his entire career working on the issues our panel will address today, uh, those of human rights, governance, uh, and free expression and independent media. We are going to uh, try to have just a conversation. We will not have a sequence of speeches, uh, but just a very dynamic interaction. Uh, let me start with you, and going from the general to the more specific, I want to start with you, Santiago. When did the train, uh, the pro-democracy train, derailed, and why? Um, you know, we had uh, the, the expansion of democracy everywhere in Latin America. We were celebrated. We were celebrating ourselves. Uh, we had a good story about the democratization of the region. And now, for a long while, we have been living into uh, what has been called uh, by Lyra Diamond the recession, the democ democratic recession, and uh, and the problems that we are going to discuss today. But when, what failed? What, what stopped that trend? Thank you, thank you. First, thank you, Danette, for, for inviting me. Um, and congratu congratulations to the, the four organizations that received the, the, the award today. Uh, really, it's a great choice by Danette. Um, all the region is in trouble, Central America, Central America particularly is in trouble. And the four organizations work on all the issues related with the rule of law and democracy. So it's an excellent choice. Um, so your question is uh, the, the first line of uh, the book by Marius Vargas Llosa, Conversaciones de la, la Catedral. When, when, I don't know how to translate it in English, but the question is, when did the Peru started to go wrong, to put it nicely? <laughs> and um, I, I would go back a little bit. Uh, I will go further back. Um, in 1959, uh, Tad Schulz, who was a, a correspondent for the New York Times and uh, covered Latin America and, and Cuba particularly, uh, wrote a book that was the, the Twilight of the Tyrants. Uh, and the first, I will not quote it exactly the same, but the first line of, the, of that book was, uh, um, the years of the dictatorships in Latin America is over, something like that. That was the first line of the book in 1959. Uh, Five years later, uh, Latin America was completely full of dictators, all over dictators. So the, the wave of between democracy and, and authoritarian governments in Latin America is not new. This is the, the one we are somewhat still living in, is the third wave of democracy. You know, and uh, and uh, particularly, I'm very afraid that we are starting already to live, you know, the, again, the authoritarian, a new, a new authoritarian era. Um, when did this one in particular start to go wrong? I think number one, one thing to look at is leadership. Uh, we spoke about that a little bit. If you compare the leadership back from the, 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 the first democratic president elected in this third wave was Guzman in the Dominican Republic. But if you compare Alfonsin, uh, Erwin, uh, Lagos, Sarney, uh, Fernando Enrique Cardoso, uh, with today's leaders, you see a big, big difference. I mean, they're, they're, we, those were leaders that had a very strong conviction on the rule of law and on democracy and on human rights. They, you know, they, they, they really believed that they were starting a new era of democracy, and it was going to be democracy forever, and, and, and they fought for that. Um, today, you don't have that. You don't find one leader, basically, in the region that has that, that conviction 
and that fire inside to, to do. That, that's number one issue. The second one, I believe, is democracy did not deliver on the issues that people really live on. I mean, they didn't live, deliver on, on poverty. They didn't deliver on democracy. They didn't deliver on food. Uh, the democracy didn't deliver the basic things that I will get want. back to you on yeah. why. Why they right. didn't really deliver. Uh, Commissioner Orejola, Ore um, <clears throat> you represent the hope. You represent uh, the, the, the democracy, civility, and uh, you know, fight for human rights. Uh, in short, the international community. You are uh, part of an organization that comes uh, and tells governments that they're misbehaving and, 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 and tries to deal with uh, human rights violations. Um, what has changed in recent years? The, as Santiago mentioned, we have gone through different stages. Tell us a little bit. You, you, Santiago gave us the big picture. I want you to give us the specifics, the details, the day-to-day -day, uh, -day, uh, activities of what is representative of the international community. What's going on? Well, um, thank you very much. A lot is going on, actually, but um, I, I want to start with what Santiago was saying. Um, um, I was reading lately um, the book of Anne Applebaum that says that the decline of democracy isn't inevitable, but the survival of democracy isn't ine inevitable too. And I think, first of all, um, after the dictatorships and the armed conflicts in Central America and with the beginning of all the democracies, we I think we kind of fell to sleep a bit. When I, when I talk about we, I mean all of the countries in the region and political actors. Um, and uh, and I think we 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 lost track of the importance of of um, feeding the democracy and feeding the democratic institutions and and the the institutions regarding human rights, the ombudspersons in the in the different countries, the judicial independence, the importance of judicial independence for for the for the exercise of human rights. And in that sense, I think that the international community, um, all of, of whom we are part of, we kind of fell to sleep and we, we, we um, concentrated on the most grave human rights violations and yeah. forgot about the capacity building and forgot about continuing working with the states and the different um, judicial and the Congress, I will say the Congress, on matters on human rights, and I think that is something that um, we have to we have to uh, reinforce. Um, and secondly, I, I think that um, change things have changed. Um, it's not the same to see human rights violations in a context of dictatorships than human rights violations in the context of democracies. But at the same time, we have to continue um, being alert. We have to continue working with civil society. We have to continue in enforcing um, human rights defenders, um, the, the, the alerts of what human rights defenders tell the, the international community of what's going on inside the countries. And at the moment, I think that with the pandemic, all, all these issues have been ha, have got more urgency um, because we have seen the effects of the economic and social problems the pandemic has left, with more social discontent, and how the institutions, the democratic institutions, cannot answer to the different um, um, things that the people need. That's why I'm trying to 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 answer with what. Um, Santiago was saying. And right now, if you ask me what's going on right now, the, um, I think um, there are a number of issues that are very worrying for the Commission. I would say the situation of human rights defenders, I think that's a thermometer when you start to see that human rights defenders whose role is to defend human rights are being threatened. And I think that has to be a, termo a thermometer, you say in English, of 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 when, when we start getting um, precautionary measures from human rights defenders themselves, that they need protection. When the states have the obligation to protect them, is that something is going on? When, when journalists start to be, to be um, persecuted, criminalized, when journalists have to leave their countries, when journalists have to, out, to do outer censorship, 
something is going on. And know all those things, we are seeing them today. And what has changed is that we have elections, yes. We have um, elections of Congress, we have elections of the executive, but we do not have um, institutional, democratic institutions that are working as they should be. We do not have independent mechanisms inside the countries to defend human rights, to defend journalists. And I think that's the most um, worrying situation at the moment, if I would have to highlight some of the situations we are seeing today. That's why I think, um, and, I, and I, I would like to say, I think that the different organizations that today Ned is um, awarding is very important because these are all human rights defenders that are that are putting their own life in threat to do their work. And I think that's very, very um, important that we highlight their work. Thank you very much, Commissioner uh, Urejol. I will get back to you uh, with question. You, you are the rapporteur for Nicaragua. So I, uh, I get back uh, again uh, with you and ask you to give us a sense of the flavor of the, the, the moment. What, what, what do you see? Luis, uh, um, if the commissioner mentioned uh, journalists, you know, uh, that's among many other uh, threats and difficulties that journalists uh, living in Central America have. Uh, but before we get into the details, I, I remember that um, attending meetings about uh, the internet becoming or being uh, a source of, uh, of liberation, a technology of liberation. And now I go to meetings in which the, the internet is presented as a tool as a, of repression. And it's both. Uh, social media bo work both for the activists and for the uh, police departments and the repressive uh, entities. So, and it's very country specific, but give us your, uh, your sense of where, what's dominant, the technology of repression or the technology of liberation? Uh, so thank you, thank you for for that question. It's very very timely too, and uh, and at the same time, I want to thank the net for the for these events and honoring the uh, the four organizations, including some of my colleagues, uh, uh, journalists as well. I think um, that's a very good question. Um, it says, uh, I mean, you're asking uh, that question to to someone that truly believe in, in the power of freedom, right? Uh, so uh, to me, as I remember, I think Santiago remember when he was at the Special Rapporteurs, uh, as a press freedom Special Rapporteur, I remember uh, when we were talking that, um, you know, the people complain about the abuse, the media is abusing and now using the social media. I remember always saying, I think it was Claudio Grossman at that time telling me sometimes in democracy the the excess or the the abuse the media may ha may ha may may do in democracy and openness might, sometimes is necessary if we want to keep democracy. So social media um, certainly is a is a big issue. It's a problem, and it's not going to end. It's going to continue and it's going to be used by repressive regimes uh, just as much as it is relevant for uh, journalists and reporting. I'm always say when I ask the question, should we regulate much more? Or uh, I said, you know, the way to, to, to go against the use of social media to censor the press is doing better journalism. It's doing more journalism and more information in the hands of people. And we need to make sure that happens. So to me, social media, despite all the setbacks after the spring revolution, and we, we work at, uh, in Egypt and other countries as well, and we were one of the organizations that you know, uh, was in the middle of that debate, we still believe that we are better off having citizens, especially citizens, civil society groups and the media, obviously, with open access to social media. It's extremely important. And right now, what we have is basically uh, populist regimes uh, basically paying uh, an army of trolls and, uh, that are capitalizing on the, on the same, very same technology that was supposed to uh, democratize news and information to uh, not only uh, create uh, campaigns against journalists, uh, but also 
uh, using technology to hack in the communications of the media and, and um, human rights defenders, uh, and basically uh, 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 trying to minimize the uh, fact-based reporting that good journeys are doing. Um, uh, you saw in the, in the, over the last few weeks, I've been actually a lot on the media talking about uh, the investigations uh, that was uh, revealed through the so-called uh, Pandora Papers. This is a you know a consortium of journalists working together to reveal news and information. And you look at what most of the, especially in countries where you have some of their leaders mentioned in the investigations, I mean, you, you won't believe the the how many pro-government, uh, so these are people that are, sometimes they are not even working uh, uh, in, in the government, but they are paid to use social media and technology to minimize the credibility of the media and the journalists. And we need to face that. And, uh, and um, we says I could talk to you more. I know you wanted to talk more about, okay, what are we doing to we'll, face that? We'll get to that. Uh, Santiago, if somebody tells you the the, the most the, the the most significant violators of human rights in Latin America is not governments but criminal organizations, what do you say? Sorry, I always forget to turn this on. The first answer is uh, is technically wrong, and I know Antonia will be on my side on this. The human rights was created uh, uh, to look into violations of government. So if a, a, a terrorist group kills a thousand of people, it's not a human rights violation, it's a different thing. So technically it's not, uh, uh, only only governments can violate human rights. That, that has been changing over the last couple of decades to include corporations and other things, but still the concept is it is government. Why, why is that not that just a semantic difference? The, the, the fact so is more people are tortured, killed, and maimed right, by so criminals living, than by governments. So leaving, leaving that aside, but, but in history, you know, if we go back a thousand years ago, it's always government, the one responsible. So that's why in 1948 it was approved in order to look after governments. Uh, right now you do have you know, countries such as uh, Mexico or countries in Central America in which the the, they are criminal organizations that have probably similar or more power than, than governments. And, and uh, so conceptually, we, we, we might, on the human rights community, we might have to start to look into you know, different ideas. Um, but, um, uh, and, uh, you know, I, but I don't know, I'm not so sure that that, it, that is a, the main problem of our democratic crisis, to be frank. Uh, I think the crisis uh, uh, on democracy is because of our leaders. It's because of democracy did not deliver, going back to that issue that I mentioned before, uh, you know, the famous quote by a former US president in a campaign, are you better off than four years ago? Or are you better off than 20 or 40 years ago? And the answer is no, they are not better off from the perspective of the people. And, and then, I will, now I will answer your first question, yes. when did it start? Yeah. I, if, if I have to pinpoint one, one moment, I would say it was in April 1992, if my memory doesn't, doesn't fail, me, fail me. And that's, that's when there was a, a Fujimori, Fujimori's self-coup. Uh, and why, why do I choose that? Because since then, what we are seeing today is the type of things that Fujimori did, which was to, to destroy democracy through, through means that look like democratic. Uh, Chavez taking over the Supreme Court, Bukele taking over the Supreme Court, using the Congress as a rubber stamp institution without you know, real uh, discussion. So, this, this way of destroying democracy. I mean, I remember the first conversations, probably you were part of that with people from Venezuela thinking about Chavez, I'm talking about uh, 2002, 2003, and that was happening, but nobody was saying this is no longer a democracy. While it was clear that it was going into that, into that direction and we didn't react on time. Right now, the same thing is happening in El Salvador. And we have to say El Salvador is no longer a democracy. In, and we have to start to act right now using the instrument that we have 
which is the Inter-American Democratic Charter, created precisely because of what Fujimori did. The person who presented the Inter-American Democratic Charter to the Permanent Council was uh, the former Secretary General of the UN, Javier Pérez, uh, Javier Pérez de Cuellar, from Peru. And he wanted to create a system to avoid what happened in Peru to happen in other countries. So we do have the instrument. We never use it the way it, ha it has to be done. And we are not using it because the leaderships of the regions, they are looking themselves in the mirror and they don't want to touch it. Thank you. Commissioner Urrejola, you are uh, not only you are the head of the IACHR, but as I said before, you are the rapporteur for Nicaragua. Give us a sense of what's going on and also give us a sense of what can be done in order to, to contain these, uh, these trends and these conditions. Um, well, uh, the situation in Guatemala, uh, sorry, Nicaragua has got very serious, but it's been, um, um, it's been a, a road that's been um, uh, each narrowing since a few years from now. Um, the commission visited Nicaragua in May of 2018, where we 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 had a, a serious crisis of human rights with with um, protests. Um, a lot of the students were were killed by police forces or or unidentified civilians. More more than 328 people were killed in the context of the protests. And since then, there's been an ongoing situation um, of of um, narrowing any the any uh, pu public space any any public opinion the the civil rights organizations uh, uh, legal personality has been cancelled the independent press they have been confiscated their building has been confiscated they have been censored and um, a lot of people went to exile um and and then we have we have been since the beginning of the crisis there was a I don't remember exactly the, the number, but a lot of the students that were first in the protest were criminalized and were taken to prison. Then they were liberated by, by different groups. But after that, since then, uh, the world sometimes forgets that things have been continuing. The repression has continued. The, the lack of freedom of expression has continued. The lack of freedom to, to have any manifestation on the streets has continued. Um, it has, the, the repression has, 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 has has had different faces, but it's been um, an ongoing situation. We talk about a, a, a state of emer a, a political, a police, um, estado policial, un estado policial, um, as a, young, a, a long time ago in Nicaragua, and uh, more than a hundred political prisoners. Uh, I'm not talking about the ones that have been now detained. Since since the beginning of the crisis, the commission has been talking of more than 100 political prisoners, people that have been imprisoned and have been charged um, because of their political thoughts. And then in the last two or three months, what we have seen is uh, um, a more focalized repression towards any leaders of the opposition. And when I talk about leaders of, of the opposition, I have to be very clear that I'm not only talking about political leaders, I'm talking about human rights leaders, um, civil organizations, um, um, campesino, movimiento campesino, any, any dissent. That is why you see it, it, among the prisoners more than 30, you see leaders of the of the of private sector, leaders of political parties that that had the the uprising with the Sandinismo, like Dora Maria Telles, she was part of the revolution, or Victor Hugo Tinoco, both of them um, fought with Daniel Ortega, Sergio Ramirez is outside of the country, but also then you have uh, um, Violeta Granera, who was more related with the right wing, but she's also imprisoned. You have Tamara uh, Davila, who's a, um, a human rights defender on women's rights. So you have different kinds of people, not only, and I think it's important for people to understand that we're not talking about the political opposition, political, I mean by political parties, we're talking about any leadership, civil rights movement, um, the, the rights of the um, campesinos, and, and also uh, and private enterprises, journalists also. We have a journalist that have been imprisoned because of using social media against the government. That is the situation we have today, when there's no chance of any political dissent, and, and, the, and the press 
that continues, the independent press that continues, of course, either they're leaving the country or they think it twice before saying anything because they can be imprisoned or they will have to leave. And that is the situation today. Um, there is no conditions to have fair elections because there's no conditions to have a political debate where the community, where the Nicaraguans can see the different elections and can discuss, discuss the different elections and can have fair access to the different programs. And of course, you don't have any, any, any competition. That is the situation today in Nicaragua. And um, we are very worried about not only the elections, but what comes after that, because there is no independence at all of the, the judicial body, the, the, the Congress, um, the ombudsperson. I mean, there are no um, contrapesos, no counterparts. Um, so no, there's nowhere, the people that are against the government, they have nowhere to go to find justice or to okay, just but, denounce but, anything. Um, let me stay with you for a second. What, uh, what tool are you missing in your toolkit? The situation in Nicaragua, the way the situation you describe is so extreme, but at the same time so clear and so shocking and so unacceptable. And yet, uh, um, you know, one thinks, what can the international community, and you are one of the members of the international, what can you do? What, you have a toolkit. There are things you can do. You have instruments. What are you missing? What would you like to have? What tool that you don't have would you like to have in these circumstances? <laughs> Don't, don't say it, Antonia. <laughs> I, I, think I was fishing for that. <laughs> I, I want to answer, first of all, regarding the toolkit the Commission has. As Commission, we have used all our toolkits. I mean, monitoring, petitioning cases, precautionary measures. We have gone to the court with provisional measures. Um, we have used all the tools we have. And we are permanently monitoring the situation. We are permanently doing press releases, thematic reports. We are, each time we are invited to the political organs of the OAS, we go and we report. I think we have been a, a very important voice uh, among the international community. Um, if, if we were the first voice, if not, I, I, I'm sure about that. I, I think the commission has done a very a historic role regarding Nicaragua and the crisis from the 2018 until now. And we continue to do all, our, all the mechanisms we have. And the fact that we have used all our mechanisms and, and, the, and the situation is the same or even worse, I think it does not put um, um, a sign of interrogation towards the commission. Um, I think the question is, what is the rest of the international community doing regarding Nicaragua? Um, we are doing all, everything that is in our hands and in our mandate, and I think we have done it well. We have documented since the beginning of the crisis um, all the violations of human rights. We have testimonies, we have artists, we have been working with civil society, which I have to say here, and that's why I'm so happy you are recognizing um, Nicaraguan civil society, because they have done a very, not only a brave job, but a very technical job, re looking for the future, um, regarding documenting the viol violations of human rights, because that is very important when you look at the future, because near <clears throat> time, I hope near, there will be transitional justice. And when we talk about transitional justice, we need to document the violations of human rights. And civil society in Nicaragua has been doing that with the help of the commission. We have been doing capacity building with civil society so that they learn to take the testimony since we can't go to Nicaragua, so that they learn to have their own archives. So in the, in the near future, when there's a truth commission, when there is justice, um, there will be the document, the documentation mm -hmm. and especially mm -hmm. thinking on memory truth and justice. But, but, but really, um, I, I think that the, the commission has, has used all the toolkits and that all those, um, all those toolkits we have used, I think they have been very important for the international community to have a saying of what's going on. Um, but I think the international community has to be more tough, to be honest. And when I talk about the international community, I don't mean the Inter-American Commission. I think we've done everything we have to do, and we will continue I, to. I, I would like. Thank to you say, very much. Santiago wants to comment. I would like to say something uh, regarding that, Antonia. Uh, I, I fully agree with you on, on, on you know, the Commission used all the tools. 
But the problem is precisely the, uh, related with the question you asked before, uh, Moises. Uh, when was the time to act in Nicaragua? Now it's too late. 2018 was too late. The time to act was when uh, Daniel Ortega started to break the rule of law. When was that? When he pushed the Supreme Court with you know, his own people to let him run again. Is it too late? So that was the is, time to act. Is it, too late to, is it too late to act in El Salvador? No, this is the, this is the time to act. And to do what? They, they should use, the, on my view, the, the tool that right now is the Democratic Charter. The, you, know, you know, the Democratic Charter has a, a system you know, to upscale uh, if the situation is getting worse and worse until Article 20, which is the last one, which is, you know, they want to expel the country from, from, from the OES. We don't want that to happen. Uh, but they should start to push for the prior mechanism the OES has, which is not being used right now. And what I, I was part of the delegation based on the Democratic Charter to go to El Salvador. What happens if it is used and nothing happens? Well, as uh, you know, as a former you know colleague of us, uh, I had this discussion one time long ago with Bob Pastor talking about uh, Castro and Cuba, and basically he said, if you have a president that doesn't want to leave office and, and the, that president has the military on his side, there's nothing you can do. Luis, I wanted to follow up. Um, if the new president of the net comes to you and says, I'm new here and I think we should do more to support journalists. Uh, and we have to do different and we have to both innovate and expand the way we support freedom of the media and, 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 the, and the media. What three or four suggestions, what are concrete programs, initiatives, ideas, technologies? Do you think the net should do more of to support journalists? That's yeah. a very good question, he says, but especially before, because he's here. So yeah, he's here. I actually would be crazy not to respond immediately, <laughs> but I actually want to go back a little bit to what sure. uh, uh, Moise, uh, has been said here, uh, uh, Santiago and the commissioner about the issue of you know where where are the instruments? Should we start now? What what are the international the international community should be doing? Honestly, uh, and it's connected to the human rights. It's a government issue. It's organized crime. I mean, as a journalist, supporting colleagues that are covering organized crime and government, I mean, sometimes it's hard to even divide in some cases, some countries, where you have government and organized crime working together. So I, I think to try to separate this and call it for what it is, is a problem. We can start by, oh no, it is an attack because it was organized crime. Maybe, maybe that's not a that's not a, 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 a situation where we can come on and use the inter-American system to attack. I, I think we need to start starting from the point, recognizing that the problem is bigger than the pro governments and that the government sometimes work with certain uh, outlaw groups, I don't know how to call it, that are not even in the system. And we have revealed that in many cases, and the international community needs to take and recognize that, that we might not be able to use the same diplomatic process sometimes, and wait too long to react. Because this reporting that my colleagues are doing are telling us this is not working. Going back to the question, I think we have, I don't think we need to reinvent the wheel, honestly. We have great experience uh, building coalitions. I mean, you, you can see now the, uh, actually one of the award winners here is someone that has been doing investigations and revealing some of the corruption that the democratic quote unquote governments are supposed to do. Uh, and the justice systems are not working. I mean, your work is you are, if you are depending on the demo, just on the democratic institutions in some of these countries, you will never want to get anything done. You need to depend on the tools that the media, that civil society can do to investigate, research, and expose some of these issues, especially when they are connected with kind of organized crime that you don't you don't even see them, but they are in some cases funding a lot of the uh, political apparatus. 
Uh, so it's going to be frustrating for the international community to try to, in some cases, try to come up and say, oh, let's wait for the this meeting or this commission. No, we need to keep uh, civil society working. One of the areas I would recommend is supporting programs that are very local, but that have some sort of regional approach. Because right now, because of the complexity of the problem that involve governments, but also organized crime that is, is not really working for the government, it's not in the payroll of the government, but they, definitely there's corruption around it. We need to, there is no media organization or no uh, institution locally that can address a problem that is connected region. Because this, the organized crime uh, and governments are, you know, you also using technology is across border. They, pro, they work across border. They go ahead sometimes of, of, of civil society, even ahead of the media and ahead of the, their own, uh, the international community. So we need uh, projects that keep supporting uh, uh, independent media through programs that use technology, promote collaboration, because they cannot do this alone. We, we need the international, international community and the international group supporting the local institutions. We should also uh, uh, strengthen uh, diverse health and diversify funding. Uh, as you all know, it's very difficult to support independent media in countries where the governments I mean, unfortunately, they have co-opted, in some cases, the private sector, including some groups in the civil society, because they work, they, 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 they basically team up to, to, to create this environment. So I would say support, innovation, collaboration, local approach, but with a regional coordination. We have to invest a lot on building trust, because, I mean, we are in a region where nobody believes anybody. Because these very same forces against democratic institutions are, are, are trying to undermine the credibility of the, uh, of the independent media and the civil society organizations. So uh, using, using technology and, and social media. So we need to strengthen the, the capacity of, uh, of, of the media to uh, build trust among the media, but also in coordination with civil society. Sometimes we journalists don't like to work too close with civil society because we want to be independent, which is okay. But we are experimenting now in cases where even the media realizes that they cannot do it alone. And we are beginning to see, and we are, I mean, we are experimenting in some cases uh, in Mexico and other places where the media is beginning and is more willing to engage with civil society, not to, uh, dictate anything related to the editorial independence, but to uh, follow up on some of the investigations the media reveal. And we, you know, the media is also looking for impact. Uh, so that's happening and it's opening a new door and we need to think broadly now and, and, and explore those con collaborations. A lot of technology, funding and support, uh, it, it threaten the capacity of the monitoring of, of, of press freedom issues that I think we, we, we forgot about those issues because we thought we were better off. Now we realize that we need to go back to the, I remember Santiago, those training on press freedom issues. Remember, we are gonna have to go back to those issues again and be country by country and, and a regional approach at the same time. Thank you, Luis. I think we are close to running out of time. We have five minutes. In these five minutes, I, I wanted to ask the same question to the three of you. Uh, I'll start with you, uh, Santiago, then Luis, and I let uh, uh, the commissioner to be the concluding uh, remarks. Uh, the, these countries we're discussing this afternoon, the Central American countries, have their main economic pillar are remittances. And remittances mean exiles and uh, uh, refugees and everything, you know, we know. Uh, how can, so these are countries that have a very active, large, economically significant diasporas. 
how can you make these uh, powerful economic actors into pro-democracy activists? How do you leverage and how do you convert uh, the members of the diaspora or a, per, a percentage, 10, 20% of the members of the diasporas in this country? Or, uh, how do you make them democracy activists? How do you convert them into a source of uh, support as strong in, in democracy and freedom as they are in the economics of the country? Great question. Great question. I don't know if I have the answer. Uh, and we have five minutes for okay. that, so you have so 30 I, seconds for the first. question. First of all, I think your, your question is very good because it goes to one thing that Luis mentioned, which I always agree 100% with everything Luis said, but on this one, uh, I do not, which is, I do think we have to reinvent the world. Uh, I, I think that if we continue to do the same as we've been doing for the last 20, 30 years working on democracy, the situation is not going to change. I mean, and I, I don't see that happening. And we need to reinvent the wheel, and maybe the reinventing the wheel is going through trying to incorporate into this, into this uh, process all the, all the diasporas that uh, are out there that are economically more powerful, and than the people inside the country and trying to get them engaged uh, in, in internally in their own country. So basically, and with this I finish, the idea will be to try to bring together th through civil society, the civil society is, continues to be the main agent of change, uh, to bring together the civil or form civil society in these countries, uh, or in this country particularly, uh, in order to push them to also work on for democracy in their own country. Thank you, Santiago. Luis? No, I think that would be uh, a great idea, but the reality is that that's, that's no, uh, it's easy said and done, right? Uh, yeah. and, 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 you know, and what, what Santiago mentioned in terms of not reinventing the wheel, yes, it's, it, the, the reason why I say it's not because there have been tools that have worked before, but we just forgot them. Yeah, yeah, so so and we need to retake them and, and reinforce them. And what you're suggesting, when it says I, I know, a lot of my colleagues have tried to get support, uh, especially the media, with the crowdfunding uh, strategy and, and getting people from the diaspora to support their work. And it has worked. But, uh, but uh, obviously, the problem with those things is that you cannot just depend on that, right? And you have to diversify the way you capitalize that support. And also, uh, it requires the building the trust. Again, we go back to that. And for that, you need to create the, the enabling environment that uh, led us to uh, hopefully trigger that kind of support that's coming from uh, the diaspora and the private sector. Thank you very much. Commissioner Urrejola, the last words. Um, well, um, first of all, regarding um, the diaspora and persons in human mobility, I don't think whether in the actual situation today they can be... Um, human rights activists, when many of them are facing um, with the pandemic, um, very uh, um, grave situations. I mean, detentions, uh, um, not access to, to, to health or education. I think for the commission today, the diaspora, especially in Central America, is is a, a, a problem of concern of, of the situation on human rights we've seen We've seen the phenomenon. We've seen what's been going on in different countries of xenophobia, and um, and some of them that have been um, detained or, or or brought back to their countries. So I think today it's very difficult to ask them to be uh, um, activists because I think with the pandemic they're facing their own human rights situations. And my, my call is uh, is more that the states that are receiving this migration have to take care of these these people who are leaving their countries because of economic or, or political um, reasons. Um, and then secondly, um, I, I agree with, with Santiago. I think we do have toolkits, but at the same time, I do think that um, the Inter-American Commission and, and any, I'm talking about the Inter-American Commission as president of the commission, but of course the international organizations such as the Inter-American Commission, I think we have to be more creative with, with 
with with our mechanisms we have the mechanisms but i think we have to have more flexibility the commission in the last few years have done for example the hias the 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 groups of inter interdisciplinary experts which i think is is a way of being more creative to respond to human rights situations or the mechanisms we have in nicaragua for venezuela and i think we have to be more creative especially in the actual context and look for different mechanisms but more than mechanisms, I think we have to to open our minds to 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 gather with new alliances. So first of all, of course, civil society, but secondly, um, even the private sector. The private sector um, flourishes at the end of the day when you have um, independent judicial independence, when you have a democracy. Maybe they can flourish. Um, in dictatorships for a while, but at the end of the day, when you have corruption, only some of them flourish, the rest not. So I think we also have to open to new actors and private sector is a, new, is a very important actor too, not only civil society and governments, of course. The hallmark of um, good conversation is that you don't want it to finish, but uh, we need to finish this. Uh, Luis Botello, Santiago, Canton, Antonio Rejola have given us a broad, uh, smart, well-informed and eye-opening perspective on uh, the situation in human rights uh, and uh, in, in Central America. Uh, please join me in recognizing their wonderful contribution to this conversation. Thank you so much, Moises. Thank you so much for leading Thank this you, discussion. Great questions. Uh, and my gratitude to the commissioner, uh, Antonio Riojola, who's with us uh, by Zoom, Santiago Canton. Thank you so much, sir, and Luis Botello you. for sharing your insights. As we prepare for the next phase of the conversation, yeah, right. we're going to screen, we're going to watch a brief video uh, that recognizes those organizations that we'll be honoring today. Uh, and then I'll invite my, uh, the honorees to join me on stage. But please turn your eyes to the screen.
Terrific, terrific. Thank you, everyone. So I'm delighted to actually now get to the prime discussion to have welcome our honorees to the, the main stage. I'm going to start and introduce on my far left, our, representing our Nicaraguan honoree, the Human Rights Collective, Nicaragua Nunca Mas, uh, Mas is Gonzalo, uh, Gonzalo Carrion, who's joined with an interpreter. Gonzalo will be speaking in Spanish, but he's worked for 30 years as a human rights defender and an advocate for those who have been victims of the abuse of power. Um, he was the di legal director of the Nicaraguan Center for Human Rights. And after the brutal crackdown by the Ortega regime in 2018, um, his organization under incredible pressure was forced to move to Costa Rica where he's based today. They continue to promote human rights. And he's now, uh, uh, is now president of the Human Rights Collective, uh, which we are honoring, Nicaragua Nunca Mas. To his right, uh, we'll move to Guatemala. And I'm delighted to welcome Helen McChang Chang back to Washington. She is the president of the Mirna Mac Foundation, of course. And Helen sadly started her fight for justice when her sister, Mirna Mac, was assassinated. And as a result of Helen's work bringing perpetrators to justice, state agents were found to be responsible for human rights violations for the first time in the history of Guatemala. Helen's known nationally and internationally as an advocate in the fight against impunity in Guatemala as a supporter for peace, democracy, and reconciliation, and for her ideas on how to transform Guatemala's justice, defense, and intelligence institutions. To her right, uh, from El Salvador, we welcome Diego Jacobo, who is the Vice President of the Transparency, Social Oversight, and Open Data Association, or TRACODA. Um, he leads workshops on democracy, transparency, access to public information, use of open data, and the public function as a citizen oversight. He's been a researcher with the Citizen Observatory to the Court of Accounts, an innovative effort to, to track auditing and accountability uh, of use of public funds. Um, he's worked as an analyst on public finance control and auditing the draft of legal reforms on NED-supported projects. Um, and in addition to that, he's been involved in strategic litigation to push for the right to access to public information. And finally, uh, to my left uh, from Honduras, uh, Jennifer Avila, uh, a journalist and founding editor-in-chief of Cantra Corriente, a digital media outlet in Honduras that publishes in-depth investigative pieces. Most recently, and very much in the news, uh, Jennifer and Contra Corriente have contributed reporting to the Pandora Papers. And earlier in her career, she spent time at the Jesuit Radio Progresso as a documentary journalist, and she's covered subjects from national resource exploitation, human rights topics, dynamics of migration, and political conflict as gender violence. I want to kick us off by just giving our audience an opportunity to get to know you a little bit better. And I want to maybe one of the things that we were intentional about and proud of is the intergenerational nature of our awardees tonight. Those who have laid the foundation and been fighting the fight and those who have picked up the torch and are carrying that forward. And so, Helen, maybe I can start with you. Your story is, is quite uh, painful and, and personal, but share with us what personally brought you into this work today. What decided you, what made you carry on the legacy? of your sister for this work and give us a sense of how, what led you to start that foundation. I think it's uh, very interesting. Uh, for me, there was a moment of hope in 2015 when I saw these new generations on the streets. And I mean, you know, it was so beautiful to see a new generation trying to change. So for me, it was like, ah, thanks God, I can pass my, my estafeta. <laughs> and then go to the ancient council, you know, the council of ancianos, the Consejo de Ancianos, because this was time to, to, to leave. Uh, but the lesson that we have seen is that the impunity of the past is the impunity of the present. And maybe in, in, I would say that um, sometimes they try to erase the memory and they want to separate that um, the human rights of the past doesn't have nothing to do with the present, and that's not true. So what we've been experiencing, uh, experiencing today is that um, what we have seen is the intelligence, uh, uh, yeah, the intelligence system of the past reloaded. You know, like Matrix, they are reloaded. So <laughs> instead of yes, because now they use the social media. They, uh, but the same thing is, this, uh, they have the same intentions, 
closed spaces. They want to, they impose the narrative. They want to kill you in a civilian way by putting you denuncias, you know, suiting you. And so you can be uh, uh, punished and that will kill you, civilian. Um, and they want to put their own story, their own truth. They don't accept, uh, they don't accept, I mean, the changes that we have been, that we were moving forward. So I think it's, um, and sometimes the millennials have another way of uh, thinking also. And that's why I'm saying they don't, sometimes they don't know what happened in the past and they have other ways of doing things. So sometimes they don't understand us. So having that interchange, talking with them, telling our experiences, listening to them, it's very interesting. And I think it's very constructive. And, and I think we have to do this click with uh, the new generations, but they have to learn that the impunity of the past is the impunity of the present. And that erodes the main principles of democracy. I think that's freedom. such an important impunity of past is the impunity of the present. Let's pick up from one of the millennials. Let me come to you, Diego. So you were a successful student at university. What led you to take this path and to form Tracola? Yeah, well, uh, actually, it's quite a funny story because it was about five years ago. We were a bunch of, uh, you know, guys in their old, guys and girls in their early twenties, and we just had this belief that we as citizens truly are empowered to participate in the political process in the measure that you can access to public information. Uh, now we have these, we had this amazing tool, uh, the public uh, to access to the public to access to public information law that really gave us uh, this framework to work where we can um, hold our governments accountable. And, and that was really the, the notion that, that, uh, that made us begin with Tracota. Uh, and over the years, that is what we have tried to, to keep going. Again, that, that very basic idea uh, that we have the power to hold our governments accountable that no one is doing us any favor by telling us how they're spending our resources. And it should not be, um, you know, we, we like to say this a lot. We do not really consider ourselves special people. And, and don't get me wrong. I mean, we're very proud of what we do. But, but really, we're just uh, citizens who are using the tools available to, uh, to you know, promote transparency. And, and like I said, that was five years ago. Um, Sadly, the situation has um, you know, gotten uh, somewhat worse, and now is is a whole lot more difficult than it, what it used to be. But again, that notion that that uh, the ability to participate truly empowers you as a citizen. Thank you, Diego. Thank mm -hmm. you. Can I jump back to Gonzalo? Gonzalo, you have been in this fight for more than three decades in Nicaragua in a tough environment, now doing so from exile in Costa Rica. What led you to be committed to this this cause through all of the challenges you faced over these three decades? And Gonzalo, I think, hit, make sure you've hit the button Perdón. on your microphone. Bien. Yes. Eh, es decir, imposible yo reclamar un derecho si no los creo en ellos. Entonces, y, y, y aparte que existe pues, una declaración ahora universal del derecho a defender derechos, eh, en, en primer lugar esa convicción y tenerlo como filosofía de vida. Y eso este, ya tener como la mitad de la vida en ello, ha implicado un acumulado de experiencia. Transmitirle que he tenido la oportunidad, yo cumplí 60 años en el exilio, estamos en Costa Rica, junto a mi colega Wendy Flores y un, un grupo de colegas, este, defensores y defensoras de derechos humanos que nos vimos forzados al exilio en Costa Rica. Y... Probably a loud translator. ¿Puedes continuar? Sí. Sí, adelante. Ok. Entonces, este... Y ahí aprovecho para señalar de que eh, ha sido duro para nosotros continuar 
eh, sumando nuestras voces eh, en defensa de los derechos humanos del pueblo nicaragüense desde el exilio. A propósito del tema anterior de que, que puede hacer la, la ciudadanía fuera del exilio, fuera en el exilio, eh, no es fácil, como no ha sido nada fácil para el pueblo de Nicaragua su lucha por la libertad. Y entonces, este, cuando uno, eh, como en nuestra, en nuestra experiencia, porque mi colega Wendy ya tiene como 20 años también, llegó jovencita a, al CENIT, y yo llegué eh, recién, eh, ya por terminar mi carrera universitaria en, en Managua, Nicaragua, y el acontecimiento de calle, de la protesta, el tener en, en la balanza que quiero dejar claro acá aquí, y un convencimiento por los hechos. Los gobiernos denominados de derecha y de izquierda violan los derechos humanos, ¿verdad? Violentan los derechos humanos. Pero también dejar fijada una idea, nunca como en este tiempo, para nosotros ha sido tan difícil para el pueblo de Nicaragua como en el gobierno que tenemos ahora, si se puede llamar gobierno. Nicaragua está gobernada por una familia que es una tiranía y que niega cualquier tipo de derechos humanos. Y convencidos de ello, nunca hemos dudado de entregarnos por entero a defender los derechos humanos y ahora continuarlos en unas condiciones más difíciles desde el exilio. I'm already taking pity on your translator. <laughs> Can everyone hear me? All right. Okay. Just wanted to make sure. So. To begin, thank you very much. Um, I think that in order to defend a cause, in this case, the cause that would be human rights, you have to firmly believe in that cause. You have to believe in it as an option that people can truly live with. Uh, it is so difficult to apply or demand that your rights be applied if you don't believe in them. Uh, currently, we have a universal declaration uh, concerning this conviction regarding the defense of human rights. That is a lifelong philosophy, and I have been in this fight for, at this point, half of my life. Uh, I recently uh, celebrated my 60th birthday while in exile. There are many of us that are in the same situation, Wendy Flores, uh, among many other uh, Uh, advocates of human rights in Costa Rica specifically. It is really hard to continue making sure that our voices remain a part of this defense of human rights. It's hard, just like it's been a very hard battle for the community in Nicaragua to fight for its liberty and its freedom. Wendy uh, entered this fight rather early on. I did when I was just finishing up in school. Uh, I was finishing up college and, you know, and participating in protests, going out to the streets, etc. What you realize is that governments on either side, either extreme of the political spectrum, violate human rights. It has never been as hard as it is now in Nicaragua with the government that we have in place at the moment. This government is made up of a family of tyrants who reject all forms of human rights. So always, this has been something that I've known is worth giving everything to. We know this, and we do this in order to defend and protect human rights. Now, of course, in exile. Thank you so much for sharing that, Gonzalo. Let me jump to Jennifer to bring you in from Honduras. Um, share with us what brought you into this work and, and doing the investigative work that you've done in Honduras is actually dangerous. What's brought you into this work? What's been the most rewarding part of your work as well? Well, I'm a reporter since I was 20 when I started Well, when I was in the university, I I liked the profession. I think journalism is important in the society. I think journalism must investigate and must tell the truth. And I was, as a citizen myself, I was thinking that in Honduras we didn't have like real journalism. So, well, I... I started working as a journalist and in 2015 with the Indignados movement, 
which was very important to my generation and Kathy's generation, <laughs> um, because we lived a coup d'etat in 2009. That was really shocking for, for us, for my generation, that we thought that we will never live something like that, and we did. And then in 2015, all the people in the street uh, was in the all the people in the street asking for anti-corruption fight. And um, well, I thought then, and I met Kathy there, and we were just uh, we we were arguing about the need of journalism in this special point where when in when our generation was asking for the truth, asking what what is happening with the national resources, and uh, that was like the right question, but we thought we didn't have like the right information, so. We kept arguing two years, <laughs> and we founded Contra Corriente in 2017. Um, and we thought, well, this is not only a news media outlet. This should be a school for a new generation of journalists, because Honduras need edu needs education first. And uh, we we build Contra Corriente as that, as a news media outlet, but also school for young journalists and also school for the audience. So we know Andres is a place where the people need education. The audience needs to be educated too. So it's a very small and slow job we have to do to educate the audience, to make also the right questions and also to doubt about everything that they see on the news in general. So we don't have many friends in our media, I think. <laughs> But um, I think it has been really fun, also not only dangerous. Um, we we had made this uh, big uh, this big place to for people to come and tell their stories. I think we also are encouraging people to tell their stories to 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 tell how the corruption affects their daily life. And that is helping us also to break silence in Honduras. One of the <laughs> biggest um, things that we have in front of us is that people is afraid to, to speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, that silence is very, very difficult for us to, to ask people questions, you know, or, or to go to a place um, to, to, to know what's happening there when people is afraid, when people don't have guarantee of their rights. So I think we have been working on that on these last four years, and it has been really nice seeing people now telling their stories and using our platform to tell their stories and to understand the country. I think also what Helen said, it was so powerful because we said, hey, we need to know our history. And and we realized that our generation didn't know what happened in, in Honduras in the 90s or in the 80s or why Honduras is in this, why democracy failed in Honduras with a coup d'etat in 2009. And so I think uh, we we have that, uh, like that mission also. And um, I am happy with it right now. I don't want to speak a lot of how dangerous it is because I think a lot of people here know that Andres is dangerous, but Andres is dangerous for everybody, for all the people. It's violence everywhere. Where every every space is co-opted by organized crime. So I think that's well known. Um, and uh, I think it's very brave for the people, not only for us as journalists, because we're, we're only like in the middle of the thing, but all the people that is speaking out and um, that. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Jennifer. Diego, let me come back to you. You've, you've used some very innovative techniques um, using data, open source data, the Citizen Observatory. What have you found to be the most rewarding in a way, way place where you feel like you have been able to hold accountable or expose injustice? Well, the most rewarding uh, part of, of what we do is is when we see the impact that it has when we actually have forced public functionaries to answer what we're asking. Um, you know, in, 
Jennifer has just brought up something that uh, I believe it is true also to El Salvador. Um, what does my generation and the newer generations view as a democracy? How do we leave that? Uh, El Salvador, as most people know, um, just barely 30 years ago was in a civil war that ended, and we have been living in a somewhat democratic system ever since. And I say somewhat because, you know, um, a lot of it didn't work, a lot of the system didn't work. And there were so many things that we just took for granted, and we thought that was that was the way that things are. You know, they're not going to change maybe for the worse, but they won't change for the better. And that was the you know that, that that was the mindset that maybe a lot of people from our generation uh, find themselves in. And it, it to, to truly believe first in yourself in the fact that your voice counts, your voice matters, and uh, and like I said before, no one is asking, no one is doing any favors to you when you're when you're pushing uh, the political power or when you're pushing public institutions to actually work in your benefit. You know, uh, we tend to believe again that government institutions only answer to higher interest, but they are there for a reason, and the reason is that they have to provide us with answers. So it, it, when we managed to do that, on, on the, first, the very first exercise that we did was uh, something related to expenses with Congress uh, congresspersons. That was back in 2015. And that had a major impact, you know, on media and, and things like that. And we were, okay, we're onto something here. Yeah. And we just kind of built upon that. And we, when we, and again, I said this a lot, when we as just, this bunch of, of young people, um, you know, asking the questions, we were, we were generating this noise that was very um, satisfactory. And but the most satisfaction that we get is, is when when we do these workshops with youth groups, uh, with diversity groups as well, when we try and, and, and provide the tools that we have come to know so that they can do the same for themselves. What they ask for is not the same that we ask for. But what we all do is to try and get the government to work for us. And we have seen people who, are, who have participated in our programs who then go on to become public functionaries or do their own thing, and establish their own NGO. And, and to, ha to have the, the, the notion that you played a part in that and uh, empowering citizens to, to work to, towards that end, and that is the most satisfactory. Thank you, Diego. Um, Helen, you have talked, Helen, about the effort to break the cycles of impunity and corruption that repeat itself. And yet what we've heard from all of you this week is it's not just a sense of treading water. It's a sense that things have gotten sharper. Things are getting more difficult, more complex and more difficult. How have things changed? How do you see with your perspective on the region what's happening right now to democracy across the region? How is this different? Apologies if I wasn't clear. <laughs> I think that um, Guatemala and Colombia were the last countries that we had uh, internal conflict, but our countries really never had the vocation of democratic of democracy. We just accomplished the form of we call democracy just by voting, but democracy is a lifestyle. And you have to believe in it, just as uh, Gonzalo said. You have to believe in those principles. And when you fight for those principles, they will always accuse us of being communist because they want to maintain the status quo that gave, gives them privileges. And one of the, moving forward, I would say in democracy in our countries was um, judiciary, independent judiciary. So when the judicial start being independent, they didn't start liking it. Less if they were investigating corruption. So 
I guess that there are many factors that makes it complex, like um, organized crime, because corruption or the grand corruption is, it doesn't matter if it's left or right. That's what also in human rights, that what Gonzalo was saying. It doesn't matter if you, it's a left or right government. There's no ideology in corruption. There is no ideology in human rights violations. So when you have a um, judiciary that is independent, when you have judges, prosecutors that really, you know, gives you the idea that uh, the law is equal for everybody, that was a hope. But, um, and that's why they don't want democracy. <laughs> and that's why I think that we are, uh, we are going backwards because the grand corruption, the kleptocracy systems is eroding uh, uh, the, the democracy. Mm-hmm. And maybe in a, if I can bring Gonzalo in on the regional issue, some of you have talked about how the autocrats have learned from each other in Central America and that some of the playbook in Nicaragua is metastasizing throughout the region. Can you talk, Gonzalo, a little bit about how you see trends across the region? How has Nicaragua influenced that? But also the converse of that. Luis Botello was talking earlier about the need for a regional approach to respond to the challenge. And is there scope for cooperation, solidarity across civil society to put a break on the backsliding that you see? In the conversations that we've had in these days, Nicaragua has been mentioned a lot como un mal ejemplo para la región. Obviamente tengo que decir no el pueblo de Nicaragua, ¿no? Sino este, la familia Ortega Murillo que está empeñada en perpetuarse en el poder ilegítimamente. Y en la vida eh, los malos ejemplos son como propensos a, a imitarse rápidamente, más en cuestiones políticas. Y definitivamente... Eh, en la medida que se prolongue un, un régimen como el que tenemos nosotros, este, estamos tan cercanos que tiene mala influencia. Solo quiero recordar, incluso a propósito de la reelección, eh, cuando la corte nicaragüense le dio eh, por la vía jurídica la razón a Daniel Ortega en su eh, pretensión de ser candidato a, prohibido por la Constitución, alegaron que eso mismo se había hecho en Costa Rica, porque ya, y como un derecho político humano, no se le podía despojar de su candidatura. Entonces, definitivamente, los malos ejemplos, y particularmente en el caso nicaragüense, que la perpetuidad en el poder, la reelección, el continuismo, ha sido dañino, porque nosotros tuvimos, poniendo el ejemplo con nosotros mismos, 43 años con la dictadura somocista y Ortega tiene casi desde el 79 que siempre ha sido él el candidato desde el 79 42 años ya verdad y va por el cuarto periodo consecutivo de forma ilegítima no hay duda que esa forma de gobernar de, desde una posición de concentración absoluta de poder es dañina no solo para Nicaragua y, y de, la, de lo que estábamos escuchando de las conversaciones, eh, todos estamos viendo malas señales de esa tendencia autoritaria de los gobiernos y que en definitiva eh, no hay que esperar que el, esa, ese cáncer ¿verdad? Eh, le haga más daño a las sociedades, no hay que esperar tanto. Y termino con una, una, una expresión. Eh, este, en Nicaragua, en el 2018, ya habían centenares de personas asesinadas y eh, por estos lados, en la OEA, eh, se discutía si llamar a Daniel Ortega dictador o no. ¿Ya? Y entonces, este, yo, yo creo pues, que, en definitiva, 
tenemos el gran desafío y particularmente la sociedad de los pueblos en la decisión de vivir en libertad, ¿verdad? Y en el caso concreto de Nicaragua, Nicaragua va a conquistar su libertad por decisión del pueblo que ya tomó esa decisión con su voz poderosa a partir de abril de 2018 y que eh, además de la decisión de nuestro pueblo es necesaria y legítima la solidaridad internacional. Antes de comenzar una pregunta. In recent conversations that we've been hearing uh, happen over the last few days, Nicaragua has often been cited as a bad example for the region. Obviously, <clears throat> what we see in this area is the family, the Ortega family, that wants to remain in power illegitimately, of course. Uh, and throughout life, you will know <laughs> that uh, bad examples tend to repeat themselves, uh, at least politically speaking. Um, and obviously, if this regimen, if, the, if this regime continues and we remain so close to it, it's going to have a negative influence on the rest of the region. Um, there, of course, is a desire for re-election. And when the, when the court in Nicaragua allowed Ortega to continue as a candidate for re-election, often what they said was that, well, this has already happened in other countries in the region anyway, like in Costa Rica. So a bad example uh, is what Nicaragua is usually, uh, is usually um, framed as. And obviously this continuation of uh, his candidacy is an example of that negative influence. This has been going on since 1943 with the Somocista dictatorship. Ortega has been in power now since 1979, so that's 42 years. Um, and there's no doubt that this system of governance where you have an absolute concentration of power is negative not only for Nicaragua, but for the entire region. We are able to sense the bad signals coming from this government trend. Um, we should not wait for this cancer to continue negatively affecting uh, our societies. And I'm going to close with uh, one final remark. Um, Nicaragua, uh, ever since 2000, well, I'm sorry, uh, Nicaragua has uh, been dealing with this problem for quite some time. And uh, in 2018, there were already hundreds of people who had been killed. And at that time, here in the OAS, they were starting to ask themselves whether or not they should refer to Ortega as a dictator. Mm -hmm. That's right. Diego, can you pick this up? Because you've also um, talked a little bit. Bukele has innovated, if you will, but you've also talked about some of the commonalities that you've seen across the region. Yes, truly. Well, um, I believe that we we must talk about El Salvador, Central America, in the wider global context of the recession in democracy. And we're starting, well, we have seen in the last years, uh, governments turning towards a more authoritarian uh, sort of, 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 uh, of governance. Um, so you take Central America, for example, and there are a lot of issues that are similar to, to our countries. And if you were to see Central America as, as you know, as, 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 as a region, uh, then you have the two sides of, you know, the two extremes. On one side, it would be Nicaragua, to all of that uh, Gonzalo has described, and on the other one would be El Salvador. Uh, just until very recently, El Salvador had not not nearly perfect, but at least somewhat working institutions that could be a counterweight to the political power. Uh, you had um, a Supreme Court who sometimes, sometimes would be a true counterweight in checks and balances um, to the government. 
but they had, that has all changed uh, very recently. So we could discuss a lot about what truly constitutes a democratic government, but there are two elements that I believe are uh, paramount to talk about a democratic system and that we don't have that in El Salvador as of now. The first one is something Helen has mentioned, and that is an independent judiciary. It is absolutely paramount to any system, to any democracy, to truly have judges that will answer to a higher interest and to the, to a higher in, uh, benefits, and not just to uh, you know to to the winds of whoever is in power at that moment. And the other one is a tolerance, but more than a tolerance, a promotion of freedom of the press and freedom of expression. And that is, uh, we should see governments that promote and truly encourage people from the diverse backgrounds, and, you know, whatever uh, the cause that they're fighting for, whether that is transparency, whether that is minority rights, whether that is LGBT rights, environmental rights, et cetera. Uh, they should be tolerant to criticism. They should be tolerant to other views and they should try and engage people who think different from them to, from from themselves to participate in the political process. And at, in El Salvador, we have this worsening condition where it is an increasingly hostile environment uh, to people, you know, uh, independent media and people like ourselves. And again, we we with Tracoda, we we started this just four years ago, and in that very short time span we have seen things deteriorating at, at an alarming rate. I would not say this is irreversible as of now. I believe that there is path to move towards more uh, balanced uh, state of affairs, but things, you know, we need to act now. Now is the moment to do this. And just, just this very close and quick remark, it, uh, a democratic system should not be measured by the amount of people that vote in an election. It should be measured, as I said, in how it promotes and tolerates participation from different backgrounds. Mm -hmm. So, so we, do have, we do have two elections looming in Nicaragua and Honduras, um, quite different experiences. But Jennifer, maybe in Honduras with elections, I think in a month, what role do you see for media outlets like Contra Corriente? How, what can you play? How do you see media playing an electoral process uh, and how that interacts with what you would expect for democratic standards for an election in Honduras? Well, Honduras is, is coming to a very critic election in November. I am on. Um, we think we're going to repeat or maybe it would be worse than 2017 because we don't have guarantees that we will have a clean election. We don't have um, trust. The citizens don't have trust in this in the counting and transmitting data um, system. Um, and also there's this big white elephant called Juan Orlando Hernandez. And no, who everybody knows who he is and what he's done, but nobody says anything. He's not. He has not brought into justice yet, um, and uh, he also is um, is in open campaign. You know, you, he is not a candidate. He cannot be reelected, but he is in open campaign um, now. <laughs> we we don't really understand who's the presidency candidate for his party, because it seems like he is, is himself. <laughs> um, so we also have been investigating a lot. And one of the, well, the, the real candidate for his party was on the Pandora Papers, for example. And that experience, I want to tell you how it was, because this is a presidency candidate that he didn't want to speak with me. He was always closing the uh, the, um, the official events. Contra Corriente journalists are not welcome with him, and he's the the candidate and the and the mayor of the of the capital of, capital of of, of Honduras. And um, all the national party has been like very restrictive with the with the independent press, and it has been really difficult to investigate them, but. We have investigated them since uh, all these years, and there is no clean option in that party. And then we have in the other party, in the Liberal Party, 
a candidate that's running for presidency seven months after he came out from the jail here in the US. So these two are candidates for presidency. And then we have um, a new alliance, a new opposition alliance, just as the 2017, with a lot of possibilities to win, but in a co-opted system run by the National Party. So what we see is that we will have a very conflictive elections on November and, uh, and a lot of violence. We already have political violence in the species, but also in the communities, a lot of people that is threatened, candidates that had been murdered in the, in the municipalities, and uh, a lot of things also of the organized crime, reorganizing, trying to, to hold the power that they don't want to, to just give it up on, on November. So mm -hmm. I think journalists, we have no guarantees in this coverage. We covered that on 2017 and no guarantees for the press in the streets covering protests no information, all the official spaces that were closed for independent media. And, um, and we don't have any protection mechanism. We have one, like it's written that we have a protection mechanism, but it's not practical. And we really don't have protection when we are doing that, that job. And uh, um, I think it's a very dangerous time for, for Honduras. November is very decisive also. But it will it would not be easy as it has not been easy to investigate all these corrupt actors going now on re-election. You know, <laughs> I've been interviewing this same guy, this this congressman that is on the angle list, on the Magnitsky list, in every list you, you can give. Uh, and um, he's re-electing like he's I think he's, he's his sixth period as a congressman. And uh, he's impugned, as a lot of them and a lot of mayors in the same way. So it's really difficult for us to be pointing like an inter and, and investigating corruption and all the Pandora papers and everything, but they're impugning the, in, the mm -hmm. in, in, in the country. So that's very dangerous for the press covering that, that stories. And Gonzalo, just briefly, the election in Nicaragua, which is not a credible election. What is the role, is there a role that civil society can play in the election or after the election? How do you see that briefly? No, ya la, las señales están eh, bastante marcadas. El 7 de noviembre se va a consumar un fraude que ya está este predeterminado porque a final de 2020, inicio de 2021, en, este, a la víspera de un año electoral, se, aprobaron, se aprobó un combo de, de leyes en, este, eminentemente represivas para imposibilitar la participación en un proceso electoral eh, con las características eh, para que sea valorado como libre, universal y secreto. No hay en Nicaragua las más mínimas condiciones para, para elección. El 7 de noviembre va a haber votación, pero no hay elección. Eh, en ese sentido, eh, la pretensión de perpetuarse en el poder el 7 de noviembre eh, hace indicar que sí este, lo van a lograr consumar el fraude, pero eh, no está eh, totalmente claro porque Nicaragua está lleno de incertidumbre. ¿Y por qué no es claro? Porque se va a profundizar la ilegitimidad del régimen de Daniel Ortega y Rosario Murillo. Ahora mismo, lo que compartía este, el señor Zúñiga, la votación de la OEA, 26 votos. Eh, es decir, Nicaragua eh, tiene una tendencia a aumentar la ilegitimidad, a aumentar la ilegitimidad y... este Depende mucho exactamente de lo que yo decía anteriormente, de la voluntad y la decisión del pueblo de Nicaragua de vivir en democracia o sometido a la dictadura. Yo creo que el pueblo de Nicaragua ya tomó su decisión. Muchas gracias. 
first of all, I'll start by saying that one of the challenges coming up is the decision to live freely in Nicaragua. Nicaragua, uh, I would say, has already begun to make that decision uh, through its community uh, starting from April 18th. Uh, international solidarity will, of course, for that reason, be necessary and legitimate. Now, concerning the elections, it is clear that on November 7th, fraud will occur. Um, this is a process that really began near the end of 2020, beginning of 2021, where a series of laws were adopted, repre uh, oppressive laws to essentially make impossible anyone uh, participating in these elections legitimately. Uh, that is to say, there are no conditions for a set of elections that would be free, universal and confidential. So on November 7th, there will be voting, but there will no be there will not be a true election. Uh, the desire to stay in power, it, we have seen, will likely succeed in this case. But some things remain unclear. Why? Well, because Nicaragua in this situation will see its illegitimate government continue to grow. And just like Suñiga said a moment ago at the OAS, 26 votes, uh, Nicaragua is going to continue to have its uh, illegitimacy, illegitimacy continue, I'm sorry, uh, deepen. And much, I think, will depend on, like I said a moment ago, uh, Nicaragua's decision to live freely. And I think that that's something that Nicaragua will do. So as, we, as our members of Congress are beginning to arrive, I want to begin to close us out with a question. Our honorees this week have had an opportunity to meet with administration officials uh, at the White House and the State Department, but also Capitol Hill. And uh, I want maybe, Helen, I'll start with you. Just your expectations. What is your message to the United States, to Congress, to, to policymakers in Washington uh, about engagement in Central America? Um, if you know Helen, you know she's not shy. You have been willing to speak out this week. Uh, please share with us some of those thoughts. Well, uh, what happened is that uh, in our countries, being honest and frank and directly, we have consequences. Whether, whether they will kill you or whether they will put you in a blacklist. <laughs> That's why sometimes when, when I, I am very frankly and direct here, I, I, I feel. <laughs> but if you're giving me that opportunity, yes. First, I would say that um, I would like that they see us as a region not dividing us from North Triangle countries and Nicaragua aside, we are the same. And what it happens to the, to the region, if Central America has a flu, that will impact the US now and will impact in your security as migration, whatever you wanna call, but also impact us very directly. So for us, it's not dividing us. It's not dividing because the, the policy has to be a foreign policy that has to be applied. And for us, we are not seeing if you are Democrats or Republicans. It's a foreign policy that affects us and we have to work with the administration, whatever administration is. So that's why that foreign policy has to help the region because now we are your border. Maybe in a different, uh, we can, maybe we can have different circumstances of Mexico, but we are your border. So that's why I think that uh, you have to, I'm sorry, but I think you have to listen us because sometimes you believe that you are listening us, but you are really not listening us. So I'm sorry if I say, I'm sorry. No apologies, Helen. Is she, um, I will a testament for whether well, that's what, what happens. And when we say we need check and balances, if, you really, if we really believe in democracy, we really need check and balances. And the main issue for having check and balances, and I think with Tracoda we've been very uh, on this, is have a judiciary, an independent judiciary. Yeah. When you don't have independent judiciary, we don't have anywhere to go. And really, <laughs> um, and our institutions are very weak. So believe the other people that are in power and what the institutions are saying, and that's a lie. And that's why they listen to the government and they are not listening to us. So we, are, we appreciate that National Endowment has been honoring civil society because maybe by our reports, you're listening to us and reading us that we're saying the truth. 
Helen, thank you so much. I think that is a perfect way to end. If anybody <laughs> knows the endowment, the ethos, it is premised on listening to you. The way we operate is to be demand driven and to understand that this is your fight, this is your struggle, and to figure out what we can do to provide both material but moral support for what you're doing. And so that's the point of this evening. I think that's a perfect way to wrap this conversation. Our members have joined us and I think we will transition to the award ceremony, but please join me in thanking our honorees for sharing their views before we honor them tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was a, I think, a compelling way to wrap our conversation, a compelling way to begin our award ceremony. I want to welcome our members who have just arrived. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Um, so good evening. I'm going to welcome all of those who have tuned in online uh, to join this broadcast just now. Uh, again, I'm Damon Wilson, the president and CEO of the National Endowment for Democracy, America's Foundation for Freedom and Democracy. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the uh, formal part of our award ceremony today, the Endowment's 2021 Democracy Award. For those that are following on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter, please join in that conversation. Use our hashtag DemAward and EdNedDemocracy. At the endowment, our work is about what you just heard. It's about what happens on the front lines of freedom. We have a historic, indeed an urgent mission as we work to help the grassroots activists on the front lines end this ongoing democratic recession and usher in a democratic renewal. Our work is to stand by those who struggle for democracy and human rights and to stand up to those who try to stop them. We honor and admire their courage, their resilience, and their sacrifice. And that's why we're gathered this evening, to celebrate those who persevere in the face of obstruction, intimidation, and threats. So this year's Democracy Award honors the work of four courageous civil society groups who are working to confront the crisis of democracy in a region so close to our own, Central America. The Mirna Mack Foundation from Guatemala tackling cycles of impunity. The Human Rights Collective, Nicaragua, Nunca Mas, searching for justice for victims of state violence. Contra Corriente of Honduras, working to expose injustices through investigative journalism. And Tracoda of El Salvador, that's using data and transparency to advance the rule of law. These four outstanding organizations represent a larger effort at the grassroots across the region to address critical issues of governance, accountability, and human rights that are so fundamental to the struggle for democracy, justice, and human dignity in the region. But in a sea of bad news, they represent good news. They represent the pathway forward for the region. So tonight we celebrate them. Tonight's an expression of solidarity and support. And tonight we recognize the extraordinary resilience of Democrats who inspire our team each and every day in our own work. So to kick off this event, I'm delighted to introduce and welcome to the stage Ken Wallach, who's the chairman of the board of directors of the National Endowment for Democracy. He's one of the reasons I'm so proud to have joined the endowment under his board leadership. Ken is also the co-chair of the Commission of Presidential Debates, a member of the advisory committee for USAID. And for more than 25 years, he served as president of the National Democratic Institute, one of our four core institutes. He has been a terrific partner. Ken, please, the stage is yours. Damon. Um, I am very proud to be part of this ceremony, which in itself represents the mission of the endowment, that is democratic solidarity. And that solidarity is also symbolized by the award itself. This small scale replica of the goddess of democracy that was constructed in Tiananmen Square during the student movement for freedom and democracy in 1989. The original statue was created by art students from the Central Academy of Art in Beijing 
and by democracy demonstrators. It was unveiled in Tiananmen Square on May 30th, 1989. And during the government crackdown five days later, the statue was destroyed by a tank, an unforgettable moment that was witnessed throughout the world. San Francisco sculptor Thomas Marsh led a project to recreate a 10 foot bronze replica of the original goddess of democracy with the help of Chinese students. The bronze replica was unveiled in 1994 by Chinese dissidents and speaker Nancy Pelosi in San Francisco. Later, Marsh created smaller replicas of the statue to recognize those around the world who have made contributions to the movement for democracy. And we are very grateful to Tom Marsh for um, his support of, of this effort. With that, I am privileged to introduce our keynote speaker, um, Senator Tim Kaine, who represents Virginia in the US Senate, where he holds seats on the Foreign Relations and Armed Services Committees. He chairs the Foreign Relations Subcommittee on Western Hemisphere, Transitional Crime, Civilian Security, Democracy, Human Rights, and Global Women's Issues, all pressing issues for our awardees this evening. Closer to this home, he also serves as an honorary board member of the endowment. He began his career in public service in local politics as a member of the Richmond City Council. His former Senate colleague, Barbara Mikulski, a one-time council member in nearby Baltimore, once boasted that in this country, we do not arrest our dissidents. We send them to city council. Senator Kane rose in state politics, becoming Lieutenant Governor and Governor, and then nationally as US Senator, Chairman of the Democratic Party and Vice Presidential Candidate. Senator Kane never lost his affinity for Central America. After graduating from college, he ran a technical school founded by Jesuit missionaries in Honduras, where he trained teenagers in carpentry and welding. It was there that he formed his core values that guide him today. Fe, familia y trabajo, faith, family, and work. Senator, we are so pleased to welcome you to the NED for this occasion, as we honor our four Central American partners for this, their courageous work in Guatemala, El Salvador, Nicaragua, and Honduras. Senator. Well, thank you, Ken, y bienvenidos a todos. It is such an honor to be here uh, at this organization. I care very, very much about the organization, but I am particularly just inspired by the fact that you would recognize in this year's awards, brave NGOs, brave leaders in a part of the world I care very deeply about, but which needs sustained US involvement and engagement and often does not get it. So thank you for recognizing these four powerful and, and meaningful organizations in Honduras, Nicaragua, El Salvador, and Guatemala. As, as Ken mentioned, my public service career actually did not start on city council. It started when I was at Harvard Law School, and I noticed everyone around me was excited about maybe going to Wall Street and making a lot of money, and I knew that's not what I wanted to do. But because I didn't know any lawyers, I didn't know what it was that I wanted to do. And so I decided to take a year off in the middle of law school and connect with Jesuit missionaries who at that point were missionaries in the Missouri province. And Missouri province Jesuits had been asked in the 1950s to sort of lend some of their members to the Yoro province in Honduras, uh, along with uh, Spanish missionaries, for Gallegos from Galicia. And so in the Yoro province, one of the provinces in Honduras, most of the priestly functions at churches and medical clinics and schools were done by Jesuits, either from the Missouri province or uh, Galicia. I went there and said, 
I would love to just volunteer for a year. And they said, what do you do? I said, I'm at Harvard Law School. They said, that's precisely worthless. Um, I said, my dad is a welder. Now, okay, now we can talk. Um, they had just started a school, the Instituto Tecnico Loyola, and they needed a director because the director was leaving to go to Panama to com, uh, continue studies for the priesthood. And so I had a one month immersion experience with the previous director he left and then I ran the school for the rest of the year. Let me tell you about Honduras in 1980 and 81. It was a military dictatorship. The Jesuits I worked with were persona non grata because they were fighting very, very hard for lo demás, the least of these. Um, a Jesuit that I knew, Guadalupe Carne from St. Louis, was murdered by the Honduran military a few years after I left. I met a number of Jesuits who came to El Progreso, where I lived, to participate in retreats. Some of them were later murder victims at the um, University of Central America in San Salvador in the late 1980s. The Jesuits at that time and today, in places all around the world, were deeply engaged in social justice activities as a matter of faith, and yet were being persecuted because they were standing up for people who didn't have anyone else to stand up for them. It wasn't that different in Guatemala and El Salvador. Civil wars were going on that were killing thousands and thousands of people a year, mostly poor people, mostly indigenous people. In Nicaragua, the regime of the Somoza family had been toppled by a new Sandinista government, but the United States was already amassing troops on the southern border of Honduras and into Nicaragua to try to destabilize that brand new government. That was a very formative experience for a naive young person from Kansas City who had just been a college student to go into that environment. Um, and, and it felt a little bit dangerous at times. Here's something that makes me sad. I've gone back to Honduras a number of times over the years. Jennifer, one of the award recipients who started uh, Contra Corriente, ella trabajó en Radio Progreso, Radio Progreso, the Jesuit radio station. And I used to live with all the people that ran Radio Progreso and they'd get a call in the middle of the night that somebody had bombed their transmitter and the guy would pick up his toolkit to go down and try to get it started up again. As, as fearful as I occasionally felt and being around others who were afraid as well, I think it might be worse today. I think it might be worse today. I think Nicaragua could well be worse today in some ways. I think, thank God, the civil wars in Guatemala and El Salvador are over, but there's still huge, huge challenges. I. We, we would like to believe that things get better, you know, that things get better in a year or 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, but there are parts of the world, including Central America right now, where the evidence is not necessarily pointing in the direction of things are improving. There has been a democratic retrenchment in this part of the world. And let's be honest, we can't be holier than thou about it in the United States because we've seen democratic backsliding here as well. And other parts of the world have seen democratic backsliding. And that's why NED is so necessary. Democracies are in need of love today. Democracies are in need of work today. We sometimes spend time on my committees, armed services and foreign relations, thinking about our adversaries. We need to think more about our democratic allies and tackle the ailments that are afflicting the democracies of the world and do that together. Why have things backslid? That would take way too long. And, and there are so many reasons and there's so many challenges and causes, but let me just focus on things that we in the United States can do better. Our attention to the Americas is episodic only. I mean, if we're gonna be honest about American foreign policy, American engagement with the world, what we would have to say is this, most administrations, Democratic and Republican, most secretaries of state, they know the world has an east-west axis because they fly east and west all the time, but they don't fly south very much. The, the proportion of time that we devote to nations to our south, either in the Americas or in Africa, are just dwarfed by the time and attention that we spend going east and west. Europe, Russia, China, the Middle East, Japan, 
we don't spend the attention that we need to on the Americas in particular, and we're all Americans. You know, we, we all name ourselves after this super overachiever, Americo Vespucci. What, what, what guy got two continents named after him? We all call ourselves Americans, North, Central, or South. We're deeply connected, and yet the U.S. attention to the Americas has been extremely episodic. If there's a, a challenge at the southern border, we get interested for a while, but then our attention fades. And, and often when we pay attention, it's not even really about the Americas. The Monroe Doctrine was about the Americas, sort of, but it was really to try to keep Europe from engaging with the Americas. It was more focused on Europe. During the Cold War, we did some things in the Americas, but it was more about the Soviet Union than it was about the Americas. And so one of the things I try to do in the Senate, and especially now that I've recently become the chairman of the committee overseeing the Western Hemisphere, is I'm trying to convince the Biden administration and with colleagues. I recently took six, three from each party to four nations in the Americas. I'm trying to have a more continuous, consistent, permanent engagement with our brothers and sisters who all call ourselves Americans. And we need to do that. The other thing that America needs to do is we need to be more consistent in the Americas. Not just consistent in our presence, but consistent in our, in our values and approaches. Here's one example. We very much want the Organization for American States to be strong and to play an important role. And we're happy when the OAS shows that they're willing to stand up and take a tough stance, for example, against the atrocities going on in Venezuela and try to call for a better chapter in the future of Venezuela. And we're glad when they do that. But when the OAS stood up after the re-election of the current Honduran president and said the election was so fundamentally flawed that it should be rerun, Washington official didn't, didn't stand up for the OAS then. Instead, Washington official them just recognize the new government. And what did that new government do? The president of Honduras is implicated in multiple criminal cases in the United States for being involved in drug trafficking into the United States. And so we not only need to be present, but we also need to be consistent. If we're gonna speak up against human rights, it shouldn't matter whether the government we're speaking up is, calls itself socialist or communist or, capitalist or authoritarian? Is it a government of the right? Is it a government of the left? I hate corruption. I hate dictators. We need to be consistent in our approaches in the Americas if we are to be respected. The last thing I'll say before I get to the, the important point, which is these honorees, is we also need to acknowledge as Americans that a lot of the pain in the Americas, and especially in the Northern Triangle, is very connected to us in this country. As I watch accountings of, you know, the crisis at the border, people coming to America's Southwest border, there's often a little bit of an attitude like, you know, how dare they? Why, why are they coming here? You know, why would they do that? Their pain is connected to our pain. The pain of people living in the Northern Triangle is connected to Americans' pain. The American pain that drives Americans to spend billions and billions or trillions to buy drugs, to buy illegal drugs, to deal with whatever pain they're feeling in their own life, that pain inflicts massive pain on the countries in the Northern Triangle. Poor countries <clears throat> without a lot of income, if Americans are willing to send a lot of cash out to get drugs transited through those countries, it corrupts institutions, it corrupts the police, it corrupts governments, it corrupts representative bodies, it corrupts prosecutors' offices. It leads to gangs fighting over turf, which cause innocentes to lose their lives and lose their hope. And so when we wonder why people come to the border, we can't act like we can put up a wall, no matter, it could be a million feet high. We're still connected. We are still connected. And we have responsibilities to acknowledge that and then work in tandem with our 
American brothers and sisters in the Northern Triangle to find solutions together. But it's hard. How, how do we as a United States, a Senate, a Biden administration, how do we meaningfully play a role where we're more permanently engaged and we're more consistent in our values and we're acknowledging that our problems are often connected? How do we do that with unreliable partners? And sadly, so many of the governments have been completely unreliable partners. And we could invest a billion or 10 billion or 100 billion, if you invest in an unreliable partner, you're not going to get the result. You're not gonna get the improvement in people's daily lives that you want to. Well, that's why these four organizations are so important. If we are to be more engaged and if we're to be more consistent, we have to have partners on the ground and there are no better partners than NGOs that are standing up and being courageous, just like the Jesuits I worked with now more than four decades ago. And you have in these four NGOs that Ned is representing tonight, great examples of just small grassroots, humble, but powerful, but powerful and motivated and courageous leaders. And if you invest in leaders like that or organizations like that, it is the most likely path that we are going to have to be successful in finding our Americans, our American brothers and sisters, forging their own paths to futures where they don't have to export their young people to other countries, but their young people can live in their neighborhoods near their families and friends and have opportunities. So I'm, again, I'll, I'll, I'll finish where I started. I'm so happy that Ned decided to recognize these organizations who are doing such good work on a part of the world that's so very important and so connected to us. And I'll close just with the beautiful prayer that we used to always say at mealtime when I was in, in Honduras. And the prayer was this. Some of you might have heard it. Dios da pan a los que tienen hambre y hambre para justicia a los que tienen pan. Lord, give bread to those who hunger and hunger for justice to those who have bread. These organizations, these organizations have that hunger for justice. And Ned's decision to spotlight them and honor them and invest in them is a path we can pursue with confidence because of the kind of people and organizations these are. Thank you for letting me come and share with you tonight and felicitaciones a todos por su trabajo tan importante en esos países preciosos. Gracias. Thank you, Senator. It's obvious that the values that were forged in Central America lives with you today and terms of both your vision and your work. So thank you very, very much. Now we move on to the presentation portion of the ceremony. Um, we have three presenters and it gives me great pleasure to introduce each of them. Congresswoman Elise Stefanik is in her fourth term representing the 21st District of New York where she serves on the House Armed Services and Intelligence Committees and as chair of the House Republican Caucus. She is also a member of NED's Board of Directors. More recently, she added another title, that of mom, to her list of honorifics. Congresswoman, woman, we are delighted that you can be with us this evening to present the NED Democracy Award to Gonzalo Carrion and Wendy Flores from Nicaragua, Nunca Mas. Congresswoman.
Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Senator. Uh, and thank you to President Damon Wilson and everyone at the National Endowment for Democracy for your critical work supporting U.S. foreign policy by promoting and strengthening democracy around the world. And congratulations to all of the Democracy Award winners here today for your courageous work to advance human rights and democracy in your home countries. Your courage and the work you do each and every day is absolutely indispensable in the fight for human dignity, for freedom, and improving the lives of people around the world. And tonight, I'm truly honored to recognize from Nicaragua, Gonzalo Carrion, Wendy Flores, and their organization, Nicaragua Nunca Mas, for their incredible work to preserve the historical and horrific memory of the victims of the 2018 crackdown at the hands of Daniel Ortega's security and paramilitary forces. As victims themselves of the Ortega Murillo regime's persecution, Gonzalo and Wendy and many of their colleagues have been forcibly exiled to Costa Rica since 2018. However, they have not wavered in their effort to document cases of torture, political persecution, and other human rights abuses perpetrated by the Ortega regime. In addition to exposing to the world the abusive and sadistic rule of Ortega and his wife, Rosario, Nicaragua Nunca Mas has provided critical support to other victims of torture and abuse. And unfortunately, dictators like Daniel Ortega have been allowed to continue their abuses for far too long. Even as we gather here tonight, Ortega continues his crackdown on political opponents and any popular dissent ahead of this year's November elections in Nicaragua, elections that the United States already views as illegitimate. Going forward, it is essential for the United States and our international partners to leverage our diplomatic influence and economic power to hold Ortega and his allies accountable for their history of abuse and consolidation into dictatorship. And we must continue the important work with NGOs like NED to recognize and support these courageous organizations such as Nicaragua Nunca Mas as they expose the world to the abuses of authoritarian regimes while supporting countless of their fellow citizens who remain and fight every day under brutal repression. So congratulations to Gonzalo and Wendy and to all of your colleagues at Nicaragua Nunca Mas we are truly humbled by your courage and your work every day to stand up for your fellow citizens. I am honored to present you with the 2021 Democracy Award. Buenas tardes o, o buenas noches eh, a todas las personas que están acá presentes, que nos acompañan y a los que están escuchándonos. En nombre del colectivo agradecemos este premio que nos ha otorgado la NET eh, por la promoción de la democracia y los derechos humanos. Lo recibimos recordando a las más de 328 personas asesinadas en el contexto de las protestas de 2018 cuyos familiares se siguen demandando justicia, recordando a las más de 150 personas presas políticas que por meses y años sufren tortura y tratos crueles e inhumanos. Por ellos demandamos su inmediata libertad. A los periodistas, a las periodistas que continúan resistiendo e innovando para derribar la censura impuesta y continuar ejerciendo su derecho a informar a las mujeres feministas, a defensoras y defensores de derechos humanos, que pese al cierre de espacios, allanamientos, despojos, continúan resistiendo y defendiendo derechos humanos dentro y fuera del país. A las víctimas, sus familiares escarcelados políticos, sometidos a asedios policiales permanentes para forzarlos al exilio. Al pueblo de Nicaragua, que resiste cívicamente por más de tres años. A los más de 100.000 exiliados, que sufren el desarraigo, la separación de sus familias, en la mayoría de los casos en condiciones difíciles, 
y que anhelan retornar a un país en libertad, seguro y democrático. A las agencias de cooperación y solidaridad internacional que han apoyado al pueblo de Nicaragua y que en la actualidad es criminalizada. A las organizaciones y personas que confiaron que este equipo de defensoras y defensores de derechos humanos en el exilio continuara denunciando los abusos de poder y documentando las graves violaciones de derechos humanos en la que a la fecha llevamos más de 400 denuncias. A nuestras familias que siempre nos han acompañado. Con este premio, el colectivo de derechos humanos Nicaragua Nunca Más reafirma su compromiso de seguir acompañando a las víctimas en la búsqueda de verdad, justicia, libertad y democracia. Y creemos firmemente que no debemos renunciar a la esperanza de ello. Por eso decimos nunca más dictadura, nunca más impunidad, nunca más olvido. Muchas gracias. gracias. Good evening. I'd like to say good evening to all those who are here present this evening and those who are listening to us virtually as well. On behalf of our group, we would like to thank everyone for this award that you've given us, specifically the National Endowment for Democracy, for the promotion of democracy and human rights. We receive this award remembering the over 328 individuals who have been assassinated in the context of the protests of 2018, whose family members continue to demand justice. We remember the more than 150 uh, political prisoners who for months or years have suffered torture and inhumane as well as cruel treatment. For them, we demand immediate liberation. We thank and remember all of the journalists who continue resisting and innovating to bring down the censorship that has been imposed and continue working to apply uh, their right to inform our peoples. The feminists, the advocates of human rights who despite the shutdowns, the raids, the attacks, continue to resist and defend human rights within and outside of the country. The victims, their family members, former political prisoners who have been subject to attacks by the police on a constant basis in order to force them into exile. To the people of Nicaragua who have resisted as a community for over three years. To the over 100,000 in exile who suffer having been uprooted, separation from their families, and in an overwhelming majority of cases under difficult con conditions. They seek to come back to a country where they will be safe and live in democracy. To the international organizations of cooperation and solidarity who have, a, who have supported us as the people of Nicaragua, at, which is currently suffering its current uh, criminalization the organizations and individuals who believed in our team of advocates living in exile, we will continue to denounce the abuse of power and document severe violations of human rights, which to this date are now upwards of 400 cases. Our families as well, who have been with us since the beginning, with this award, the human rights collective Nicaragua Nunca Mas reaffirms its commitment to continue helping victims in their search for the truth, justice, freedom, and democracy. We believe that this is a hope that we must never lose. For that reason, we say no more dictatorship, no more impunity, no more forgetting. Congresswoman Norma Torres has represented the 35th District of California since 2014 and serves on the House Appropriations Committee and its Subcommittee on State and Foreign Operations. She was born in Guatemala and has been a champion in Congress for addressing the root causes of migration from the region. It was her amendment to the 2019 Defense Authorization Bill that required the Secretary of State to send to Congress a list of corrupt officials from the region as a mechanism to hold officials 
accountable. We are so glad, Congresswoman, that you are joining us this evening to introduce Carlos Palomo Sosa and Diego Jacobo Valladeras from the Salvadoran organization Tracota, as well as Helen Mack Change and Lisette Vasquez from the Myrna Mack Foundation. Congresswoman. Buenas noches a todos. Uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me here tonight. Senator Kane, it's so great to see you. Um, thank you for your love, your dedication, your hard work, and for never giving up on this important region of our hemisphere. Um, been following your work for quite a long time, and I just cannot thank you enough. Um, thank you to the National Endowment for Democracy for all of your important work in Central America and throughout the world. It is wonderful to be here among these uh, amazing, just amazing organizations, champions of human rights and democracy from Central America. The region and causes that are near and dear to my heart, personally and professionally. I appreciate all the work Ned does to support these brave actors and influence our policy and programming in this increasing challenging environment. We see daily attacks against the rule of law and, democ and democratic institutions across the region. We see emboldened leaders act more and more brazenly to protect their own corrupt interest. It is increasingly clear that we cannot rely on these governments as credible partners. So instead, we must rely on civil society to carry the mantle of democracy. This is why it is such an honor to present this award to the Transparency, Social Controller, and Open Data Association from El Salvador and the Myrna Mack Foundation of Guatemala. These groups are confronting the challenges in the region with remarkable spirit to fight against all odds for change. Tracoda's commitment to transparency and anti-corruption is meeting a critical need. In closing civic space, Tracoda adeptly pivoted from championing reform to pushing back against corruption and authoritarianism. Tracoda's work to strengthen security for civil society and activists, as well as grow support for freedom of association and information is allowing the anti-corruption fight to move forward. Their media savviness and public awareness campaigns help show how transparency and accountability affect Salvadorians' day-to-day -day lives. We saw just this past weekend, as thousands took to the streets, the power of anti-corruption movement in El Salvador. I'm so impressed by your work. And the Myrna Mack Foundation is accustomed to being the alarm that sounds against human rights abuses in the hard fight for justice. In fact, the foundation was born from that very struggle. Without your staunch advocacy and commitment, we may have never seen accountability to your sister's murder and many other human rights cases. You are continuing the fight that your sister started and you have been a voice for all Guatemalans who deserve to live in peace, who deserve to have prosperity and hope. As you know, this work does not come easy. You face daily mental, physical, 
and professional risks for challenging the status quo and speaking truth to power. Every day it seems that there are new setbacks and provocations for those of us who care about the rule of law. However, those of you here, those of you in the region, continue to fight despite the great personal risks to you, to your lives, and to your families. Your commitment and your bravery give me hope for the region. It is the reason why I continue to fight and push alongside you. It is incumbent on those of us with a platform and power to speak up, to defend you, to protect you, and to enable you to continue doing this critical work. We cannot allow those fighting to silence us to win. Thank you to Ned and to all of you today. You have my unwavering support and I look forward to continuing to partner with you on this very important work, not for us, not for them, but for the future generations, like that five-year-old Norma Torres, who deserved to have a seat in the Congress of Guatemala, but my future was stolen from me in the region. We must protect those young kids so they too can see a future for themselves in their own country. Thank you so much for giving me the opportunity tonight. Déjame nomás darle okay. esto y luego vienen al lado. Hi, good evening, everybody. I would like to say just a few brief words. Well, first, um, I would like to thank, to take this moment to thank the National Endowment for Democracy for recognizing us with this award and overall for their continuous support in promoting democracy and accountability in an increasingly hostile environment for civil society in El Salvador. It is in their name that we take this award. El Salvador is facing an acute decline in democracy. Since this last May, there are no counterweights within the Salvadoran government, and we have seen an increase in harassment towards civil society and independent media. The point that we would really like to get across to our allies and partners in the United States, but also in the international community at large, is that governments without a strong and independent judiciary and that act hostile towards people who promote accountability and transparency are not reliable partners in the fight against corruption and all of the root causes of inequality and migration. I would like to finish saying that we ask that you continue to support civil society, civil society and media, the people on the ground who put themselves at risk for their work in holding governments accountable. We cannot, we cannot do this work without you. Only through a strong and robust civil society we will be able to promote better conditions for our region. Thank you very much. I didn't have time to make my translation, so I don't know if the interpreter can help me, so I'm gonna do it in Spanish, I'm sorry. 
Um, well, first of all, I wa we want to thank National Endowment to recognizing the Mirna Mac Foundation work. So, <clears throat> este, eh, en nombre de la Fundación Mirna Mac, nos sentimos muy honrados y agradecidos eh, al National Endowment por el reconocimiento que nos han dado, pero no solamente es a la Fundación, sino que también a toda la sociedad civil, que es importante que se nos escuche. <clears throat> Y todo esto es a pesar de todas las adversidades en las que hemos estado sufriendo últimamente. Todos los países de la región se han estado cerrando los espacios para la sociedad civil. Y vimos con suma esperanza eh, es el plan que el presidente Biden lanzó. Sin embargo, cada vez se ponen y se cierran más estos espacios. Y todo esto porque estamos con la firme convicción de los principios de la democracia, de la importancia de luchar contra la corrupción y la impunidad, de defender los derechos humanos, la expresión de libertad y también de la independencia judicial de pesos y contrapesos de los principios democráticos. El, re, el denominador común en la región ha sido el incremento de gobiernos autoritarios y son responsables en buena medida de la consolidación de varios fenómenos que afectan gravemente los derechos humanos a la población. La gran corrupción formada por un sistema cleptocrático, la narcocleptocracia, que tiene que ver con los partidos políticos, la captura del sistema de justicia, que es la que debería de aplicar con independencia, imparcialidad y objetividad los delitos que se cometen. Y para ello se han impulsado han impulsado una, gen, una agenda regresiva con patrones, con patrones similares en toda la región. Y eso incluye la cooptación o la captura de instituciones de control y encargadas de la administración de justicia. La criminalización, campañas de desprestigio en contra de todas aquellas personas que no pensamos igual que el régimen. Y esto va dirigido especialmente a jueces independientes, investigadores, eh, fiscales, defensores de derechos humanos, autoridades indígenas o pueblos indígenas, en el caso de Guatemala, defensoras y defensores de derechos humanos y también eh, reporteros independientes, la, los medios independientes. Cada vez se hace más endeble la división de poderes y las, regres y las acciones regresivas ponen en evidencia la forma en que actúan las redes político-económicas ilícitas para llevar a cabo estas acciones al margen de la ley y satisfaciendo sus intereses mezquinos, garantizando así la impunidad, tal como se ha logrado demostrar en las investigaciones que la Fundación ha hecho con el apoyo del National Endowment. El premio que hoy recibimos por parte de NED nos sigue comprometiendo con, esta, eh, con los compromisos de la democracia de la lucha, y de la lucha contra la impunidad, que es la que socava la, la democracia. En un contexto como la pandemia del COVID, se nos hace aún más difícil, pero que esperamos que con la solidaridad internacional eh, podamos sacarlo adelante. Muchas gracias. Good evening, everyone. I'm hoping that the interpreter will be able to translate what I just said, <laughs> because I didn't manage to get a translation to him. <laughs> so I'm going to start by saying that civic spaces are closing left and right, and we had a lot of hope for Biden's plan, but nonetheless, we have to recognize that those spaces are closing. We continue to believe in the fight for democracy. We have to believe in the fight for people to express themselves freely. We must continue to work in order to foment counterweights within our current systems. As the president of the Mirna Mac Foundation, uh, we would like to Uh, say that we are honored and we are so grateful for the award that we have been given by the National Endowment for Democracy, as well as, of course, civil society in general. 
this is a this is an important acknowledgement for civil society because despite adversity it maintains a firm belief that we must continue to defend human rights and continue to fight against corruption and impunity in the context uh, of growing hostility against the uh, against advocates for uh, human rights and those who defend justice in our region it is now a common factor in our region the rise of authoritarian governments who are responsible in great in great measure for the consolidation of the situations that currently greatly impact human rights amongst our populations corruption the kleptocracy the narco kleptocracy i should say are clearly promoted by a regressive agenda that is filled with patterns that include the co-optation of our governing institutions and in institutions that are meant to, to deliver justice. We see defamatory campaigns constantly. We see that those campaigns are led against leaders and advocates of human rights, as well as those who don't think the same as our government. The ever-weakening separation of powers and regressive actions, which show that illicit political economic networks are working outside of the law in order to fulfill their petty desires, securing impunity, just as we have seen demonstrated in research that has been carried out by the Mir Namak Foundation with the support of the National Endowment for Democracy. The award that we receive today from the National Endowment for Democracy represents the challenge and commitment of the foundation to continue strengthening civil society capacities to exercise their human rights. We hope that we will be able to continue fomenting the defense of these human rights through international solidarity as a way to push them forward. Thank you very much. Kelly Curry is a member of the NED Board of Directors. Ambassador Curry most recently served as U.S. Ambassador at Large for Global Women's Issues and the U.S. Representative at the United Nations Commission on the Status of Women. Prior to her appointment, she led the Department of State's Office of Global Criminal Justice and served under Ambassador Nikki Haley as the United States Representative to the UN Economic and Social Council and Alternative Representative to the UN General Assembly. Throughout her career in foreign policy, Ambassador Curry has engaged in human rights, political reform, development, and humanitarian issues. Kelly, thank you for joining us this evening to make the award presentation to Jennifer Avila and Catherine Calderon from the Honduran organization Contra Corriente. Thank you, Ken, um, and thank you, Damon, and the rest of my colleagues on the NED board and the staff of the NED for um, giving me this wonderful opportunity to um, present this incredible award to a, a truly um, innovative and, and vitally important organization. Um, it, it is a real honor to be here this evening with you and to um, to present the 2021 Democracy Award to Jennifer Avila and Catherine Calderon, the co-founders of Contro Corriente in Honduras. Um, it, we've heard a lot today from previous speakers about the importance of journalists and the risks that they are taking to get information to people throughout the region and around the world. And I think that the um, awarding of this um, this important the, the recognition of contra, um, contra 
sorry, Montecorriente's work, I'm not a very good Spanish speaker, um, is, is emblematic of the importance that the NED places on its work to support media, around, free media, independent media, and those doing this dangerous and important work around the world. Um, Jennifer and Catherine, as Jennifer mentioned earlier today um, when she was on the panel, uh, co-founded Montecorriente during the Indignados protests in Honduras in 2015 because they realized that there was a, a dire need for accurate, timely, and objective information. It was important to the protest movement at the time and to the society more broadly. And they saw this gap and they created Contra Corriente in order to bridge that gap in public information. Today, Contra Corriente provides accurate, objective, in-depth coverage on human rights, the environment, migration issues, corruption, and impunity. Its brave and committed journalists take serious risks to cover topics that are often censored or underreported because they threaten powerful and dangerous interests. As Senator Kane noted earlier, the risks that we're seeing to journalists today are in some ways worse than they were in, at the height of the violence in the region. And so I really, I, I just, to, to see these two young women taking on this task, it just, it, it's such an inspiration for all of us. They've succeeded in their work in large part because they've supported the development of citizen journalists, particularly young writers from disadvantaged and historically, historically marginalized communities. Operating out of their base in San Pedro Sula, they bring a unique community perspective to their work that allows them to uncover information and tell stories that would otherwise go unreported. As evidence of the success of their model, over the past few years, Cuatro Corriente, which translates into Against the Current, has seen its audience, audience and impact grow beyond Honduras, attracting regional and international attention and partnerships. Recently, this included their contributions to the massive International Pandora Papers Exposé, which is using millions of leaked documents dealing with illicit international and offshore financial flows that help facilitate corruption and transnational criminal activity. This important expose is going to rewrite the rules on international um, financial transactions that are being undertaken to that support corruption and misgovernance around the world. And it's very exciting to see Contra Corriente participating in that. They've also collaborated with reputable media outlets across Central America to uncover regional corruption networks, foreign intervention, and the wrongdoing of, of autocrats in, their, in these countries. For their inspiring work to advance independent media and their deep and abiding commitment to transparency, truth, and justice as transformative forces in their region and beyond, it is my pleasure to present Contra Corriente today and Jennifer and Catherine personally with this award. Well, good night. Thank you for staying here. We are grateful and honored with this award, especially because since the coup d'etat in 2009, just when democracy was supposed to bloom, autocratic governments have undermined the very basis of democratic institutions. We didn't have time to experience democracy when suddenly we were forced to learn how to survive mafias and autocrats. We accept this award with responsibility because our job, journalism, is about building democracy, one fundamental part of the necessary check and balances of the democratic system. Honduras need to be told, we need to understand our history, a country where an internal conflict was never recognized, but however, a counterinsurgent state was established during the 80s in line with the repressive regional context. Now it's time to write the story to, to make in-depth investigation to understand the root causes of our democracy failure. The migration crisis is not the only consequence. Poverty and human rights viola violations and high corruption also are. Honduras now is known as a narco state. 
because the political system is controlled by mafias, private and public. It is not surprising that people only find hope on in crossing borders. Free and independent journalism is needed more than ever in that context. Citizens need to know how corruption networks are stealing national resources because it affects their daily life. The international community, especially the countries validating and financing our governments, need to know the consequences of silence, corruption, state violence, and authoritarianism is in the life of those that finally decide to flee. Contra Corriente is a media outlet, but it's also a school for a new generation of storytellers and journalists. It is our goal to give them hope and show that journalism is possible and necessary, even if it is under attack in a place like Honduras. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. Tonight has been about recognizing those who make democracy real, who make it, uh, who help deliver it in tough circumstances. But it's also, we're delighted to say that they're here all week engaging with policymakers on Capitol Hill, with those across Washington, so we can do what Helen said, that we can listen. We can listen closely to what our partners on the ground are saying so that we better understand how we can support them. So I'm gonna to close tonight just by thanking on behalf of the endowment, Gonzalo Carrion, Wendy Flores, Helen Mack, Lisette Vasquez, Carlo, uh, Carlos Paloma, Diego Jacobo, Jennifer Avila, Catherine Calderon, congratulations on being Democracy Award recipients. I also wanna express deep gratitude to Senator Kane, to Representative Stefanik, to Representative Torres, Ambassador Curry for joining the program to present our awards. And finally, I wanna give a shout out to the teams at the endowment who have made this over several months have been working with our grantees, not just for tonight, for their program this week, but for our work in the region, Miriam, Janelle, Marlena, Imel, Fabiola, Jody, Shivani, Jane, Christine, Lissa, Cassie, Zach, Sarah, and Andrew. And with that, we conclude the 2021 National Endowment Democracy Award. Thank you to all of those of you who joined us online. For those of you who are here with us in person, I invite you to join us up on the NED rooftop to enjoy a reception and to visit with our awardees. Thank you for being with us this evening.